Not on tell them not to at these times. Hey, is Amy there? Hey. How's it? All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Um, this is the first time that we do this, that ha where we have a large audience the way that we uh, currently have it. Um, I'd like to welcome a very good friend, uh, a mentor, uh, Dr. Azim Sheikh, to the group. Um, you know, I'm sure most of you already know uh, who Dr. Uh, Sheikh is. You've seen his work. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's a mentor to so many different individuals. He's, he's an implant guru, um, practices out of um, Brantford, Ontario, uh, Brantford, sorry, Ontario. And um, without further ado, Dr. Azim Sheikh. Okay, so I'll just go ahead and share my screen now, right? Go ahead. Can you guys, can you see, can you guys see that okay? Yep. Uh, I just wanted to see how I could see the uh, Hang on, just some technical difficulties here. Any way to still see my screen once I'm yeah. in the share mode? So uh, I don't know if you can, you might have to um, just get out of it real quick to see your screen again. Oh, got it, okay. Okay, so if you want to stop sharing, it's, it's the, at the very top, if you'd like. Or do you want to just go back? Uh, I just wanted to see my cell. Well, you know what? I'm good. I think good? I'm good. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I think we're good. Awesome. I think we're good here. Okay. So you guys can see this okay? Yep. Okay, perfect. Excellent. I can't see anybody's video or any, any faces or anything like that. Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure if, if you can currently as, as you're in presenter mode. Okay, perfect. Excellent. Well, let's go. All right, guys. Well, um, hang on. Let me just, uh, well, welcome to this webinar. I'd like to definitely thank uh, Hisham for inviting me and, uh, you know, to be a part of this. Uh, and, you know, of course, we're all, we're all sitting at home, not doing a whole lot. So I'm sure just many of you are here just out of sheer boredom. Um, can you guys see my face? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Everything's good. Okay. Uh, I just really would like to, okay, I'm just trying to figure out how I can see my own face. Manisha, do you know how uh, Azim can do it where he's presenting and seeing his, uh, his view at the same time? Um, I can try to figure it out. If you want, you can keep going, Azim, and then I'll try to see if I can figure it out. Sounds good, will do. Okay, guys, so um, uh, like I said, I'd like to welcome everybody. It's a little bit of a different format, obviously, that I'm not entirely used to. But again, like I said, I'd like to thank Hisham for allowing me to be a part of this wonderful opportunity. So uh, the topic for today uh, is what's new in implant dentistry. And the focus really is going to be on immediate implants. Um, so uh, just initially, I just wanted to start by saying, obviously, we're all kind of wrapped up in this whole COVID mess. And so I thought I'd share, um, you know, some some things that were given to me. Oh, for some reason that is not showing very well. Uh, some things that I thought of, uh, you know, doing during COVID. So my 28 days of activity for my kids, you know, we got a lot of great ideas for my staff, you know, uh, you know, take them outside, paint rocks, put things on your neighbors. For me, it was pretty simple. Kids wake up, get ready, brush your teeth, make your beds, all right? Help with some meal prep, do all the dishes for the three meals, Bored, I'm dad, I'm bored, I'm bored. You know what? Shut the up and be grateful, okay? Go play with your annoying brothers. There's three of you, go figure it out. All right, guys? That's my advice to you for this 28 day of activity crap. Anyways, desperate times for me really have called for desperate measures. Um, this is a video, uh, sorry, this is a shot that was sent to me. I think this is a little bit extreme, to be honest with you. Uh, for me, I like to tone it down a little bit. This is my uh, five-year-old son, Noah. So a little bit of scotch tape around the hands, a little bit on the mouth, and it seems to quiet them down for, I'm gonna say maybe about 15 to 20 minutes. So just that, again, I hope that was helpful. I'm just kidding. I mean, at the end of the day, we have a great time, have a wonderful family, and I think we're all blessed to have people in our lives. 
Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I graduated from the West, Western uh, in 2003. I have a general practice. I still do some general dentistry, but there's mostly a focus. My, my main focus is on para and implant surgeries. Um, most of what I focus on is immediate implant therapy. Um, that's anterior, molar, full arches. Um, I've done about 4,000 plus immediate implants. And I also uh, the course director for High House Implant Master Training Program. Uh, where we just, you know, we obviously run basic courses for them. Um, and most importantly, over the last four years, I've uh, run a study club or a mentorship program called the Ontario Dental Implant Network. Many of you I see are online, so I miss you all. We will be having meetings soon, I promise. Uh, but we have about 60 doctors in that network. And the goal of it, and we have a website as well, is to learn, to share, to grow, to help each other. Um, this is just, uh, uh, you know, some photos from our meetings. Um, we're also PACE certified, so uh, you all receive credits as well for today. Um, I have an events calendar online uh, that anybody can see, and one of the benefits is that doctors are able to come and actually watch surgery. There's two real ways to really take your, you know, your skills to the next level. One, uh, actually doing the procedure, and two, watching live surgery. Um, so, you know, when you click on that, you can actually see the type of surgeries that I'm performing in my office. And as a member of the study club, you're able to come in and observe. It's one of the benefits. We also have a wonderful group chat that I think it's gotten us and allowed me to survive over the last couple of weeks through these trying times. Um, and we also have a Facebook page uh, called ODI Network. You can also visit us on Instagram, uh, Ontario Dental Implant Network. And I post a lot of cases or I'm starting to now that I'm becoming a little bit more tech savvy, um, not as savvy as Hisham yet, but I'm working on it. Okay. So as I, as we mentioned, you will be receiving uh, category two credits today. I will uh, be, um, you know, mentioning that there will be a verification code that you will have to send me by email um, in order for me to be able to send you that, um, you know, the C certificate. So let's get into this, you know, is dentistry evolving? And, you know, the answer to that question is, Absolutely. I mean, I think from amalgams to composites and the bonding techniques that have changed, uh, you know, using multiple bottom cis bottle systems to now just a one step, um, uh, you know, lasers and soft tissue diode lasers as opposed to using scalpels, um, you know, even uh, NITI files and what we're able to do with reciprocation and endodontic treatment is just, you know, everything's just really changed and evolved. And the same thing with digital smile design, you know, scanning, now everything's going to completely digital. So, you know, for implant dentistry, you know, what really has changed? Um, the first thing I think is education. I think we've been able to really consult with a lot of our patients um, a lot easier through, you know, Skype, FaceTime. I, I know I've done several consultations with uh, patients in, um, in the U.S., um, but just able to educate patients. Patients are coming in more educated, and patients don't want to suffer with having, you know, teeth that you know don't move and so all of these things have allowed us to improve and do more in implant dentistry um, my philosophy has always been to keep it extremely simple so um, you know showing a patient a front tooth you know here's a missing tooth and this is what we can do to get you a tooth um, a back tooth again just keeping things extremely simple um, you know or doing a bridge uh, or you know this is a, a picture that I oftentimes use during my um, full mouth rehab cases where I show them, you know, this is the best option, you know, an all on type of option right here. Uh, you know, there's a, the fixed removable option, uh, which is basically like an MK1 attachment, um, or we have a locator option. So it just sets that when we do consults, we want to keep it very easy. And the goal is to be able to provide that patient uh, the best education so they can make the best decision. The other, uh, you know, um, front end of this is, is really discussing with the patient the hygiene and the maintenance. And I think we've come a long way with realizing the importance of maintenance for our patients who are going to be having implant therapy. Um, not only that, but also the importance of the occlusal splint or managing the occlusion. Um, in addition, uh, you know, managing patient fear. I think that's also come a long way. I know maybe seven, eight years ago, I might have been using maybe oral sedation to do uh, some surgeries and, uh, you know, now having the ability uh, as a colleague of mine, Dr. Stephen Ng, who's a dental anesthesiologist, to be able to actually allow patients to be completely asleep or completely relaxed and then just wake up and, and, and have the procedure completed it has allowed us to do a lot more in dentistry. And I would urge you all to get into some form of sedation. I think it'll really open up your practice and allow you to do more. On um, cost and budget, um, you know, I, I spend a full day lecture on this. I've done this for Strauman and, uh, and High Awesome as well on case acceptance. 
um, you know, patients complain about cost, and I think costs have gone down. Things have become more efficient. Um, but uh, I think the key is always being able to establish and create the value for what we're doing. So in my practice, again, I keep things very simple. This is just a very simple estimate sheet that we, you know, we review with the patient. Um, you know, a very simple financial agreement sheet. So I think streamlining things in your office, you have to look at your office and see how things are, are working. Um, but there's also other things like dental plan or, you know, other services that can allow patients to get approved very quickly for these treatments. And I think that's what also has changed in implant dentistry is pay, it's, we've been able to make it easier for patients to accept treatment. Um, using a team approach. I think many of us maybe seven, eight years ago did not have an efficient team. Maybe there were not any uh, you know, seminars on how to actually empower your team. So by having a team and then working with others, um, these are a few dentures that I use in my practice or that I work with, um, and then even working with a lab. You know, I think that communication and that team approach has really helped to evolve implant dentistry into what it's turned into now. Um, treatment planning, I think, has also improved in implant dentistry. I think we realize that treatment planning um, is the first and foremost being prosthetically driven. And you hear that all the time. I'm not here to belabor that point. Um, but beginning with the end in mind, I think, is extremely important. So, uh, and it's also mentioned in the 16-page guidelines uh, for the requirements for uh, implant dentistry, which I'm very familiar with because we teach this in our basic program. Um, but uh, so if you have a case like this where the patient's missing um, canines and, you know, you have that typical bone angulation, which is angled in, in a way where if you were to place the implant crowns, on these, you'd really need to, you know, do something like a cement retained uh, crown, um, being able to place the implants in a better biomechanical position. I think this is one of the things that's coming out over the last several years is that biomechanical position is causing implant failure or poor biomechanical position is causing implant failure. So by being able to, um, you know, place the implants in a more optimal prosthetic position and then being able to graft around um, the, the defects, um, is important in understanding how to do that. So this is a case that we did. Uh, one was obviously a lot, a little, a lot more severe than the other. Um, this is the post-op CT. And you can see that actually the position of the implant is going right through the cingulum access as opposed to something that would be coming out way, way too far buckle. And as a result, the biomechanics, especially if this patient had canine guidance, would be, would be a huge issue. So obviously we would change that patient to, or keep the patient in group function. Um, but that's her right side, this is the left side, and, and being able to place these uh, implants in a better, most more optimal biomechanical position is the goal. So this is the uh, three-week post-op from the case. This was actually a mentorship case that we did with one of our um, uh, colleagues. Maybe Julie's on here, so hi, Julie. Um, so uh, using cone beam CT has come a super long way, has allowed us to do so much more in implant dentistry. Um, this is just a, uh, I have a CT in my office, of course, but um, this is a case that we were planning. Um, and it's very easy to do this in front of a patient. You know, having the ability to um, just quickly uh, place implants into the site, locate the nerve, the mental foramen, the sinus, any pathology, um, and, uh, and being able to measure and draw and rotate and really visualize. Um, so this is a case where we're doing four implants for a locator case. And you can see very easily and very quickly, this is a game changer, in my opinion. I mean, I know in my practice, we've been, we've, our case acceptance has gone up by at least 30% just by having a CT scanner in our office. The, the power of this tool it, it is very impressive to patients, but very helpful, obviously, when it comes time to surgery. So implant planning, again, um, you know, allows us to figure out prior to doing the surgery, with a CBCT where we are, you know, where we feel confident placing these implants. And so this was a full mouth case, uh, upper and lower all on. Um, so there's the brain guided surgery and I'm a big fan of doing things freehand. Um, uh, and, you know, with experience comes, uh, you know, comes better results and, and better angulation, um, you know, but CT guided surgery, many of the doctors have taken to that. And what it allows us to do is allows us to take, you know, the impression and the model of the teeth um, and then merge that with the file uh, of the patient on the CBCT and the commonality, of course, being the teeth. So once they merge those files, we can then go ahead and, and make a guide. So this is a patient who needed, uh, who we treatment plan for five implants. Um, again, this was fully done digital with my scanner. 
And you'll see um, Shaw Lab had actually waxed up prosthetically the teeth in, in the position. And this is something actually I showed the patient literally in 10 minutes. I sent my STL file to my lab in 10 minutes. I had this waxed up and I was doing my case presentation and case acceptance uh, that day. That's within that same consultation. So the power of digital technology, not having to wait for impressions. And now being able to actually go ahead and create um, you know, a, C a surgical guide. Now this is the one guide. Um, which is made by Hyacin and a lot of benefits to this guy, first and foremost, the cost, uh, but you'll see there's no metal sleeves, uh, gives us full control, um, easy to access, and uh, puts our implants in the most optimal position because everything's pre-planned. Um, and so this was the case post-op, uh, the post-op CBCT, um, and this was four months later, and if you look at the soft tissue volume here, this site was not even grafted. Um, the left side, actually, we did wind up grafting. And look how close that implant is to that nerve. And that safety I set to about a millimeter. Um, and it was very accurate. You'll even see there's some bone graft on the buckle here. The left side, I did graft. And you'll notice the additional volume of bone here that we're able to achieve. But first and foremost, we were able to place this implant in the optimal position. And it's very straightforward when you have a, a well-made CT guide that fits well in a, in a you know, um, there's many, many doctors on here, including Steve Chang, who are, who are the experts, not I, I don't claim to be at all, um, but I have done my share of cases. Um, this is a lower anterior case, and again, you can see dead center. Uh, I did some grafting on the buckle, some veneer, uh, xenograft, um, just to help augment the site um, long term. But, uh, you know, so you may be thinking, well, Dr. Shake, you know, it's 12.15. I know all that stuff. So what's new? Okay, so let me give you some examples here. So we've got a case here, you know, with a patient who's fractured a tooth and many of us tried, you know, these cute little pins and a little post and we think, oh yeah, you know, it's going to last and then the tooth falls off. What's your treatment plan here? What do you do for this patient? Take it out, add some bone, come back. What do you do? Here's another patient. Uh, this patient actually had a lateral and I'll show you this case shortly. Had a lateral um, and a canine and they had pain. Uh, the, end, uh, the endo was performed on the lateral the pain and swelling still persisted, only to realize after CT that there was a fracture in the canine. So again, this is the importance of taking a CBCT because um, the, the information is, is really invaluable. Uh, this was a patient who presented with a, a massive infection on the lateral and uh, you know, it was so large uh, that the, uh, the hole or the defect ran buccal and lingual completely through the bone. And there was a palatal uh, fistula or um, a perilous. So what are your treatment plan? What's your treatment plan here? You know, are we taking out teeth? Are we adding bone? How are you going to regenerate this bone, right? Um, the patient wants an implant, right? Do a bridge. Oh, what about here where, again, you have apical lesions, um, large lesions, no buccal bone, non-restorable teeth, um, a fractured tooth, you know, vertical fracture, tooth fractures. And now what do you do? Take it out, tell the patient, you know, wait four months. Um, uh, what about a case where the patient has had multiple apicoectomies and retreatments and now the teeth are deemed not salvageable. So what do we do in that scenario where you have these huge holes? How do you manage those? Um, again, take them out, right? Uh, what about a case where the tooth is non-restorable and the patient does not have enough bone for uh, an implant, you know, and, and now your plan is to regenerate bone. What, how do you treat implant? What's your plan here? Let's say you're doing an endo and now you've discovered there's a vertical fracture. What do you do? Right? Uh, what about a patient who's got an endodontically treated tooth comes in you know, massive infection, you think you're going to retreat it, you take the crown off and you discover multiple fractures, right? So, um, is that me who's drawing? Maybe not. Okay, what about full mouth? Full mouth failing, crown and bridge, or full mouth periodontally involved teeth, or patients are just done with their teeth. You know, what's your treatment plan? What do you give them? So if this was your mouth, you know, what would you want? What would you want? So the first answer many people come across is, you know, we're going to take the tooth out. We're going to make them an S6. We're going to make them a flipper. Um, my question to you is, have you worn one of those? Have you had, try wearing your night guard for just five hours in the day. These really, really suck. All right. I mean, they really suck. Patients don't want them. What about bone grafting? So my first question is, when you do all these wonderful procedures, how do you know how much bone you're going to regenerate? Okay even horizontally, what's your predictability on grafting, right? So this is a case, again, very severe. I might've done this as an immediate now, but this case actually we chose 
to do grafting um, the same day. So we took out this tooth, massive pus infection, and there was just a huge vertical defect and horizontal defect. So we used double titanium reinforced membranes and grafted the site. That was the post-op, um, immediate post-op, and this was the six-month post-op. So yes, okay, you know, there's cases where, how predictable is that? In my hands, not predictable. I've had many, I've had some failures, those that I've tried in the posterior mandible. You know, you try to be the Isfan Urban, but you realize you just don't have that talent. Um, but this was one of those cases where things worked out. We were able to place an implant in that area. We expanded the hole via um, some Densiburs and or osteotomes, and then we sutured the site back up. What about lateral sinus lifting? You have a patient who has not enough bone in the sinus, right, in the sinus area, and now you're going to do lateral sinus. Perforation, infection, wound dehiscence. How much bone are you going to get in the sinus? I've, saw, I've grafted sinus cases too, where I come back four months later, and guess what? I'm waiting, and we're still waiting. And the patient comes back at their one and a half month post-op and says, uh, when, when, am I, when are we going to place the implants? Because, you know, they forget that you just told them it's going to be six months before we can go back in. Right? So four to six months later, you take your CT, and guess what? You still don't have enough bone. You still don't have enough bone. You've lost bone. Or you open the site back only to find out that it's completely encapsulated and it's not usable bone. So welcome to disappointment. Don't stay too long <laughs> because I'm sure many of you who've been doing this um, have been disappointed with your results. And, and I can tell you the, the few cases that I've done, I've been disappointed as well. I'm not gifted. I'm not, I, I'm not good at predictably growing bone. Um, and, 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 you know, I've been trained by, you know, doing sausage techniques and hoary techniques. It, it's not, 100% predictable in my hands. And at the end of the day, there's got to be a better way, right? You squeeze, you roll, you press. Now your bathroom looks a mess. And why is it impossible to get out the last drop of toothpaste? There's got to be a better way. Be a better Introducing way. Touch and Brush, the hands free toothpaste dispenser that works with just a touch. Touch and Brush. If they can do this, can we not do something different with implants with these cases? So, welcome to immediate implants. All right, anteriors, molars, full arch. That's what we're going to talk about today. Now, again, today's course is not to review entire technique. It's really to take you through what's possible with immediate implants, um, share some pearls and techniques with maybe some cases. And I feel like the more cases I share with you, the more hopefully you can apply that to a situation like yours. And again, these come with training, right? So, what does the literature say? I think that's important. Is an immediate approach. Um, as successful as a delayed approach. So what I look at, what you should all look at on the totem pole of um, you know, uh, reviews or studies are systematic reviews or meta-analysis. So we look at this study by Chen and Boozer. Um, this was done in 2014, aesthetic outcomes following immediate and early implant placement. It showed that there were acceptable aesthetic outcomes, whether the teeth were extracted immediately um, in both anterior and premolar okay, uh, areas. Uh, this was another study in 2010, immediate placement or immediate lo uh, loading of single implants for molar tooth replacement. And this was both a systematic review and metal analysis. And it showed that the cumulative survivor rates for immediately placed molars were similar to those that were healed in, that, those that were placed in healed molar extraction sockets. So what about the all on? Uh, again, they showed that they were, they were getting, uh, you know, that, and we all know this because we this procedure has been around for a long time, uh, developed by Paulo Malo, um, that there's a very high success rate. And I think many of us who are doing this procedure now have switched our mentality to all on six or all on as many. <laughs> I don't think many of us are doing all on four unless we have to anymore. But again, um, immediate placement, what about this study done in 2013? It's not new. Immediate placement of implants into infected sites. So again, this showed that um, the high survival rate was obtained in several studies supports a hypothesis that we can do this. We can place implants in areas that there were infections as long as we were meticulous in the cleaning uh, and uh, socket curatage and debridement. So here are some examples, again, heavily, heavily infected cases, multiple teeth that have a bone loss and infection. And as long as the site is adequately debrided, Okay, and I mean adequately to bride, and I'll go through with you um, what I like to do, and, and the implants placed in the optimal prosthetic position, um, then we can achieve for the patient a really nice a result. And, and again, using good AP spread, I think is really important um, to do that. Um, and so, is an immediate approach as successful as a delayed approach? 
The answer, yes, it is. So for those of you who are not, uh, who don't believe in this technique, um, I'm going to show you today. Hopefully you'll be a believer after today. Hisham, are you still with me? Yeah, hey, I can he we can hear you loud and clear. Oh, hang on. Yeah, I, need you to, I need you to sing with me here, Hisham. Are you ready? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, was hey, there? Hey, Manisha, my figure, yeah, I figured it out for you, Azim. Uh, this is Manisha. Um, so, if you go to view options, uh, where you're screen sharing at the top of your screen, do you see a view options button? Uh, more, I see. Where, you're, where it says screen sharing at the top of your screen, and then to the right of that, it should say view options. Do you see uh, that? Oh, no, I just stopped share. So let me go back to share. No, I don't have that option. You don't have a view options? Um, to take it off screen sharing for a second? Okay. Although it should show up on that. On the, uh, on the upper kind of panel, it should show a view options, and then it's supposed to be side-by-side -side mode. Okay, no. it could be because I'm in optimized for full screen video clip. Ah, uh, that's exactly what it is. So can you, can you minimize that? Yep. Okay. Uh, hide video, hide video, optimized for Yeah, you know what, don't worry about it, it's okay. Okay, okay. I think we are pretty good. Yeah, we'll okay. just leave it with this. Thank you look, you. You, oh, there, there, wait, wait, here. View options. I see your screen in the red. Oh, wait, what is that? No, what does that say? Go to more on the upper right. Oh, okay, more, yeah. Try that. Is there a view options there? No, it says hide yeah. video panel. Okay, okay. all yeah, right, okay. let's leave it as it is. You look great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, okay, so let's just go back here. Well, we're, we're done with the singing anyway. So I think, um, so the first step with immediate implants, I think, is having good instrumentarium. So being able to atraumatically extract a tooth. Uh, I like to use really, really small endo burrs. I like to, you know, really almost get right down into the bone and really do a, a pretty much like a crown prep on the root um, to be able to take these teeth out. And again, remember when we're removing bone, if we can remove bone where we know the osteotomy is going to go anyways, then that's where we want to remove bone, okay? Um, using a periotome, I think is super important. Can you guys hear me okay and see me? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, root extractors also help. Um, what about collecting? I think the key for immediates as well, especially when you have um, exposed threat is being able to harvest autogenous bone. Um, whether you're using your drill at slow speed, um, and that slow speed would be basically 400 RPM with no water, and collecting some autogenous bone, or using something like this, the Microops, or now Dan from Surgical Room has a similar product made by MC Bio. Um, it's a great product. It's reusable. Um, you can harvest amazing amounts of autogenous bone, even just from the local site. So this is a smaller version of something like a safe scraper. So these densibers allow us to um, basically condense bone. So this is a traditional drill. a compression wave okay? okay and the compression wave what it does is it allows you to for example my sinus sorry yeah. so it allows you in the sinus to be able to push material apically okay so that's one way it also allows us with these densibers to be able to expand the bone and I'll, and, and, and occasion I'll use those in sites that have narrow ridges as opposed to doing let's say something like a ridge split um, sinus lifting, you know, for those of you who are still using an osteotome technique, dude, you're old school, all right? Wake up, smell the coffee. We got something called the cast kit, all right? It's made by us and had the pleasure of actually attending a lecture by the inventor, Dr. Cho, um, doing amazing things with this, with, this tech, with, this, uh, with this kit. But in essence, the kit has non-end cutting drills um, and you use those, it creates a bone lid 
um, that does not perforate the membrane. And again, as long as you follow the steps carefully, there's a protocol for using this. You can gauge the floor of the sinus. You can use it for different um, uh, types of sinuses with inclinations. And then what it is, in essence, is the hydraulic lift. So we're using water pressure to be able to lift, lift the membrane evenly and, uh, and then be able to actually add bone into the site. Uh, so for those of you who are afraid of the sinus or not you know, tackling the sinus because you're worried, this is the kit that really will allow you. Uh, we used to actually have this incorporated in our basic implant training program, but then our CDSO kind of forced us to take it out. Um, but it's that easy to use. And I've known many doctors who've done many cases with this kit, even just as beginners. Okay, so uh, this is a, a, you know, Dr. Cho, who is actually doing the surgery and they have an endoscope and it's just kind of showing you once they lift the site, um, in the site, um, you know, actually adding bone in through that hole, um, just through the osteotomy, right? I indirectly, otherwise known as the crustal approach, um, as opposed to the indirect approach and just really packing in that bone and then placing the implant. Um, so, you know, technology, right, really helps. Um, implant design to me is absolutely crucial. You have to have an implant that has an active thread, that has a platform switch, um, that has a size variation by a half a millimeter, um, because you really need that. And uh, the Hyacin implant or the ET3 or even the NH, which, is, which has a different surface, um, and a platform switch really helps because with immediates, if you can't get the implant stable, then you want to be able to just go up a half a size, all right? In some companies, um, like Bi Horizons, they don't have that variation. Even uh, I think Nobel didn't have the variation that I, I really like. Not to mention that this implant is 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 you know 240 bucks, and if you have a you know it's 140 bucks if you have a if you have a package. So the cost right really helps also to do more implants. But the technology um, and being able to have an implant with an active thread, but that's not too aggressive like a Noble Active is super important because you don't want to chew up the bone and take it out. You want the implant to be able to grab onto the bone. And oftentimes you're relying only on maybe two millimeters, right? Um, having healing abutments or having a, a system with wide or variation of size healing abutments is crucial. Okay, if you don't have that, then it becomes very difficult, especially when you're doing an immediate molar where you can't seal the site primarily. And that's where um, you know, many people who are doing immediates and are not getting primary closure because they can't, um, having a healing abutment to help seal the site is critical. But what's the criteria before that? You have to have stability of your implant. And it comes back to your implant design, right? And your ability to get stability. Okay, so um, using cortical bone, okay, is imperative, right? Using the floor of the nose, using the floor of the sinus. I know everybody stays away from the sinus, but you're missing amazing cortical bone that you can help to anchor your implant. You'll notice here on this full arch case, I will choose my length of implant based on where the cortical bone is, not based on how much bone there is. I want to actually have that engage, especially in the upper arch, engage that cortical bone. I think it's crucial or imperative if you really want to go for you know, really predictable success when doing immediate implants. Um, having a good intro camera, okay, taking steps of your surgical pictures so that you can see, okay, this is a surgery that I did maybe three months or four months ago. And this is a, uh, with my CareStream camera. I mean, it's a high def camera. It's about three grand. Okay. But even just at least having something like a mouthwatch camera for two ninety nine. Thank you, Eric, um, for that connection. Um, just to be able to monitor cases, this was an immediate anterior bone grafted with an immediate tooth in a day. And that's three weeks post-op. Different cameras, you'll notice different technology, but at least you can see, because if you can't see what's going on with your surgery, there's no way that you're gonna grow. There's no way you can improve on your, 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 your actual technique and know what's happening without taking pictures of your surgical cases. And I would encourage you all to do that, okay? Because if you send me a picture of what happened, I have no clue. Or if you send me a case and there's no pictures, then we have no clue. The problem, and always the problem, is what? Bone grafting, okay? It's like, us trying to move this guy because the bone is moving around everywhere as you put it in. And I'll tell you, I am not gifted or skilled enough to be able to manage bone initially before platelet-rich fiber. So guided bone regeneration, really what we were trying to do is to regenerate bone horizontally, in most cases, vertically, very difficult. Um, and we know the principles of GBR, right? We want to exclude certain cell types from proliferating in. Um, but for GBR to happen, 
we need to exclude the cells, we need to maintain the space, and we need to stabilize the bone graft in an area that's tension free and we get primary closure, right? Right, this is hard. So it's like a cast, you know, I tell my patients, you know, we need to stabilize this bone, just like if you break your arm, we need to put in a cast so it doesn't move. If it moves, it's not going, it's not gonna work. So welcome to Dr. Shukran and PRF. I had the opportunity to be trained by him when he came, um, when he first came to um, Toronto, must've been about six years ago. And the technique, what it does in essence is we're drawing blood from a patient um, and and uh, spinning it in a centrifuge, we're collecting a clot, which we can then use to uh, you know use compress as a membrane or chop it up and, and mix it with bone. It speeds defect closure. It can improve, definitely improve soft tissue healing. And you're, it contains leukocytes and other things like interleukin, interleukins, and different types of um, cells that can help with soft tissue uh, pr proliferation. So sticky bone, the added value is being able to make something called sticky bone and having this bone that doesn't move around. So in essence, what we're doing is we're drawing the blood. And I know, actually, I believe that on the list, we have Neki Jamal, who's a friend of mine, uh, while we are keeping being on care of, so I encourage you all to take that. And as we're drawing blood, and once we draw the blood, we'll go ahead and we'll take the clot, we'll chop it up. Okay, so we're chopping up that clot. We separate the red blood cells, we keep the clot, we chop this up. And this, by the way, is available on YouTube. Okay, if you search Dr. Z shape, um, uh, you know, weeded anterior or whatever, you'll find it. So here we're mixing some bone and mix of aloe and this is xeno. You know? And this is my go-to mix for everything. 50-50 aloe xeno, this is raptose, and that's um, uh, bylos. And then what we do is we take the white tube. So there's two different tubes that we draw. You'll see there's two red here and one white, or three red and one white. When you draw the liquid from the white tube here, it starts making this ball nice and hard. And you'll see it becomes like a patty. You can throw it at each other. You can bounce it off the wall. But more importantly, it stays where you put it, OK? And so this is a study on GBR with collagen membranes and particulate graft, a systematic review. And it showed that, again, Implant survival rates for simultaneous and subsequent implant placement were similar. And simultaneous implant placement is recommended. This is 2018. And it's a systematic review and a meta-analysis. So again, if you're getting the same results that I used to get, which is grafting going back and not finding enough bone, and this study is showing, listen, placing the implant at the same time, we all worry, oh my God, there's more on the line because we're placing the implant. I disagree. I think that if you have proper technique and you follow certain protocol, you can predictably do this and actually give the patient as good, if not a better result. And many people may be disagreeing with, with me right now, but we'll go through some cases. So here's an example, right? You have a defect here. So option one, you go and graft and you come back. Option two is what I'm recommending is placing the implant in the optimal 3D position. And that's the technical challenging part. Um, number two, adequately releasing the site. Number three, grafting the site, covering the site, okay, with the collagen membrane, and then going ahead and suturing the site um, and using, especially in an immediate situation, a healing abutment to allow you to get as tight primary closure as you can. Because as we know, if we tried to close this primarily, we would have to release the tissue and change it to the position of the mucogingival junction. And that's not something that we want to do, nor do we need to do, okay? And these little gaps here, that's the benefit of PRF, right? It helps with that soft tissue healing, and you'll see a few cases coming up. So this is just the form on post-op. Okay, and look at the healing here, all right? And then that's the bone graft that, that was there. So sandwich bone augmentation is what I like to do. For any case that has exposed threads, we'll always place um, bone, autogenous bone on the threads. And then we'll go ahead and place my sticky bone mixture, uh, a PRF, uh, sorry, a collagen membrane on top, some PRF membranes on top of that and then we'll suture the site close. So this was a larger case um, that was done uh, with two, uh, I, I know Tina talked about this uh, a couple of days ago, or sorry, last week on the two vertical releasing or propellus sparing incisions. Um, there's a lot of different uh, variations on what you can do. Um, but in this case, I think it healed very well um, and uh, minimal scarring, if not any scarring, maybe a little bit right over here. Um, and that's the post-op for the patient there. You can see all that grafted bone. And that's one of the reasons why I like to use Xeno as well is you want to maintain that volume. Um, so that mix really helps to maintain the volume. So this is the post-op. And this actually um, was her two-year post-op follow-up. Um, so we have instruments, we have technology, and we have technique. 
And you take all those things together and you do immediate implants. But I will tell you, and I'll make a disclaimer right now, do not go and try the things or the cases that I'm showing you today are select cases that you should have adequate training for, whether you're taking a program or um, you know, further studies or whatever that is on developing your skills to be able to, um, you know, to, be, you know, to be able to achieve things that you want to achieve. So, you know, learning from mentors, so I've had the opportunity to learn from Dr. Salama and Dr. Stiegman, um, also uh, Dr. Urban and even Dr. Tarnow we had some nice uh, time with Dr. Tarnow as well, very knowledgeable, but also um, gaining experience and also gaining um, in, insightful pearls from each one of these. Um, also joining a study club, um, you know, like the one we have um, where this, these are, this is what we do, right? We go through courses, we do live surgeries, um, and, you know, uh, we do de demos and, uh, you know, lectures. And then, then more importantly, doctors coming in and observing. Um, I don't think that's going to happen now because of COVID, but we'll see what happens in the future. But that schedule will be up and running when it can be. Um, we also have a continuum that's coming up where doctors are able to now perform uh, surgeries on their own patients under my supervision. And they will be, I'm encouraging people to do immediate. So you can see your immediate anterior molar sinus lifting, direct sinus lifting. But um, if you want to take your skills up to the next level, then this train, these types of training programs are important. But you know, one thing that many of you do have, but you don't really realize what you have is this right here. A mother who prays for you every single day. That is my secret to success. So I would encourage you to make sure you are very good with your, you know, you're in very good, uh, you know, um, relationships with your parents, especially your mother, and make sure she prays for you every single day and your cases will heal just fine. Okay, so where's the hype? Let's start here, immediate anteriors. So here's the immediate anterior. Many of you have seen this technique before where we take out the tooth, A, traumatically, which is very important. That's why I said, you know, using these small burrs to be able to trough around the teeth so we can get some type of luxation and then support the buccal bone when we remove it, then placing the implant in the optimal ideal position. Then going ahead, and for those dental students that are watching, yes, you have to remember, apical third, middle third, cervical third. Remember the wax ups? You need to do that when you're making an immediate temporary crown. So very important to do that. And then um, allowing this to heal, keeping the tooth obviously out of occlusion. So again, many of you have seen this. This is like a customization chair side that we had done by our lab so that we could get a better match for the patient. And the same thing, a patient breaks a, an anterior, um, you know, so the bridge work is failing. You'll see right here, this bridge work is failing. We have to section it here. So extracting the teeth atraumatically, these are our initial guide pins, I guess you could say. Um, placing our implants in the ideal position, um, filling the jump gap or doing dual zone grafting, um, which is basically grafting right to the level of the soft tissue. And then um, in this case, we made her a, um, uh, a temp, she had a partial, but you'll notice how, again, there's no flanges on these and the pontics are shaped ovate so that there's they're still maintaining the, 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 the papilla, but we don't want too much compression um, in that area. So this is the post-op four months later, and now we were able to go ahead and take her impressions and give her her final bridge. Um, so many of you have heard of socket shield or partial attraction therapy. Um, I don't do uh, any cases currently right now, um, but I am in the works of working up a few cases and following up, but I've been told that this is a great technique. My other concern with this technique initially was that I had seen some patients that had had shield failures. So again, my advice would be get, go have some good training done. Um, Dr. Gluckman is probably one of the world's most renowned uh, doctors with this technique. Um, and I know there's some courses offered by this as well. Um, but I have not, I'm not doing any of these cases right now um, just because I've seen many failures of the shield and I'm still a bit hesitant on the technique, but I know there it's very promising. Um, so immediate premolar. So we, I showed you this patient initially where the patient had fractured the tooth um, on the, uh, it was a vertical fracture. The tooth was deemed non-restorable. Um, uh, and so again, troughing, you'll see this troughing done. Now, some of you may say, well, you're troughing very close to the tooth. As long as there's a millimeter between the tooth interproximally and the, the interproximal bone, um, and you leave that alone, you can trough here all you want. And the goal is to make space. So you'll see I've even sectioned, I've even sectioned the interproximal here so that I can luxate. When I luxate, the tooth has somewhere to move. Okay, so I like to actually section the tooth here and here. So once we get that tooth out, we place the implant palatally positioned. Okay, so palatally positioned where it's going to be taking the force. 
And now we fill that jump cap. So again, these pictures to me are not for teaching purposes, by the way. These pictures, I'm using these during the surgery so I can establish different angulations, so I can see where my angles are at all times. So I'll take a picture from you know, the buckle shot, I'll do it from the mesial distal shot so I can check everything as the implant's going in. Okay, one of the important things you have to understand with immediates is that you, when you're torquing the implant in, you wanna do it by, um, with the hand piece as much as you can. If you start torquing the implant like this, what, where's it gonna go? It may fall into the socket. So you have to be very careful when you're torquing the implants in. That's another challenge when it comes to doing immediates, keeping the implant in the same position you want it. So what I call, you have to man up, right? You gotta see that tricep working and you gotta make sure it stays in that position. But this is pretty much like a slam dunk case. Tooth comes out, implant goes in, we add some bone. This is just the two week post-op. You can see there's still a bit of PRF left here in approximately with to help with that soft tissue healing. This is four months down the road. And that tissue is like, you know, I mean, I show my wife this, I'm like, that's sexy. She's like, dude, you got problems, right? But that's sexy, right? And that's three and a half months later, the tooth, his crown was fabricated and, he, and it went in. Okay, and all, most, of our, most of these cases, uh, we have ISQ values for, um, and they're all tested before um, we go ahead and insert. The immediate molar to me, I think is the biggest game changer for any practice. Um, right now, even if you're good at grafting, and you preserve the socket, and you let the bone heal, you're still going to place the implant in the non-optimal position for the prosthetic. And that's what happens. The implant goes in not deep enough. You then go ahead and let that heal. You then make a crown, and the patient complains that they just spent $4,000 to have half their dinner left in the side of the tooth. So what an immediate molar forces you to do, and this is why I think it's the best option for any molar, better than a delayed approach, is that it forces you to place your implant at the right depth, thereby allowing a proper emergence profile for the final crown. So here's an example. We section the tooth, I use something, or I teach something, again, it's a full day course, on through the tooth technique, where we use the roots to stabilize the drill. We then place our implant in the, process, in the optimal prosthetic position, um, and the optimal depth, and that depth generally is about at the septum, or slightly below, or four to five millimeters from the margin of the buccal soft tissue. We then graft and look at the healing abundance. This is primary closure at its best, right? Don't cover the site up and put a cover screw in. You've just destroyed the soft tissue. Maintain the volume. And this is, you know, three and a half months later. Look at the soft tissue. Look at the emergence for the final crown. What's great about, again, the high oxygen system is that the impression copings also can match the size healing abundance. And these, they have seven millimeter wide, up to seven millimeter wide healing abundance. Okay, the careful, what you have to be careful about is ensuring that the healing abundance adequately seats, right? And what happens is, in my protocol, we always put a cover screw, and then we trim the bone all the way around that area so that we can ensure that there's passive seating of the healing abundance, okay? And now we go ahead and, um, you know, there's the final implant crown. Okay, we have that nice reverse S-curve that we're looking for. So, and no food impaction, most importantly. So, immediate molars force is the best option for any molar that needs to be removed, period. Okay, because you will, it will force you to place the implant at the proper depth. Um, it also helps to maintain the bone and the soft tissue, which leads to decreased risk of periimplantitis. You'll see most periimplantitis cases I see are typically in the post, lower posterior mandible. And it's because that site has resorbed it's because that mucogingival junction has changed, and now as a result, there's hot more tension on that area. And not everybody's doing free gingival grafting after they place an implant. So this helps to maintain that soft tissue, okay? And I can't stress that enough. So this is the case. Case in point, this was done by a colleague um, in uh, uh, one of our colleagues, our dental colleagues, and uh, actually um, in, uh, in Sudbury. And uh, the patient saw me uh, about four years later, and you'll see the implant was probably placed where the bone was, but unfortunately what happened was that it was not placed deep enough. Um, there may have been some other issues here as well, but the depth definitely is one of those problems. Okay, so if your soft tissue doesn't look like this, okay, it's because you're not doing immediate molars, okay? And uh, if it does, then you are placing your implant at the proper depth so that you can develop a good emergence, all right? So, oh, did I tell you it's one surgery as well? One step, one surgery, Four months, you make a tooth. That's it. So I think now it's time to turn it up, right?
let's turn it up and let's see what we can really do with immediate implants. So here's an immediate anterior case. This is a one, two site. Patient kept having the crown fall off. The tooth was deemed non-restorable. The two, two site just at the same time so happened to have a massive buccal swelling. And there was a suspected root fracture, although the CT scan did not show root fracture. And oftentimes because of beam hardening, we may not see that happen. So this is the case. You'll notice the swelling right here. Can you guys see that okay? Okay, right here. And there's the one, two. So what do we do, right? What do you do? What's your treatment plan, right? Take out the teeth, graft, come back later. Try telling Mary, who says, I will shoot you if you give me something removable. So there's the treatment plan. You'll see that there's a thin layer of buccal bone here. So hopefully we can maintain that. Here on the 2-2 site, you'll see there is no buccal bone. So we know we're in for a problem. So here we go. Highly aesthetic, by the way, right? So initially we take our impression so we can make some temps. There's our initial hole. So we're able to atraumatically take out the 1-2. And then there's our initial puncture point. I like to use a Nobel precision drill because it has a very sharp Y factor, a steep Y factor. Um, so it's sharper. Um, this is the 2-2. Now look, look at the fracture right here. There's a fracture right on the mesiolingual of that tooth. Okay, so for this case, and there's the tooth extracted, nice fracture. So for that case, obviously I had to open up the site to be able to visualize the extent of the infection and the buccal bone. So both implants got placed the exact same way. Okay, one, I guess you could say flapless, the other one using a flat. And as I mentioned, what's our recipe for success? autogenous bone on the threads, then sticky bone, and a collagen membrane. Now this is a very old case actually, or an older case. I don't do it like this anymore. These are vicral sutures, um, okay, that just help to hold the site. And then once the implants and the sites were grafted back to the proper, you know, dimension or where we wanted things, um, then I went ahead and I made the immediate temporary crown. So you'll see here, I was able to hit the floor of the nose. Here, I kind of wish I had a longer implant maybe to grab that cortical bone. But again, we got some really good stability. So there's a 2-2. Again, I removed all the sutures and then I went ahead and re-sutured this. And again, I don't do it this way anymore, but um, you'll notice one thing I don't like about this is there's a suture that goes over the papilla right here. Okay, so this is where suture technique is important. You know, for these cases, it's better to use vertical mattresses as opposed to something like a continue, like a single, a simple interrupted. All right, but I learned my lesson. Um, by this case, in fact, by looking at the pictures, and you'll see, here's the post-op immediate. Okay, so the patient left with teeth. Um, there's the two-week post-op. Okay, so it doesn't look too bad. I mean, the temps aren't the greatest, but she's got teeth there. There's the four-month post-op. Now, look what's happened to the papilla right here. Okay, it looks like it was compressed up. And that was my mistake when I sutured. And you, I wouldn't have known that if I didn't take a picture of my suturing. I wouldn't have known that. Right. So I think everything still turned out very nicely for her. She's extremely happy. We took impressions for her. Again, you'll see we're engaged in the cortical bone here. Um, there's a soft tissue profile. OK, and now let's see who's got more bone. What side's got more bone? Well, the one, two, that site was just an immediate. You'll see again, the buccal plate was still here. We've got some pretty decent bone, but not as thick as the side that was grafted. Right. So I actually like veneer and Dr. Khan talked a lot about doing even depending on the the jump gap and how much bone you have to still do a veneer graft on the buckle just to maintain that buckle um, bone. Uh, but you'll see this one's engaged in the floor of the nose again, and this one almost there, right? Uh, we've got good cingulum access, and uh, the hyacinth, as many systems have, the um, angle screw channel option, so we can do up to a 30 degree variance. And these are some crowns. I'm not happy, I was not happy with these crowns. Um, uh, but you'll see the emergence is not the greatest. These are stock screw cemented crowns, as you could say, or screw mentable crowns, um, a little bit wide at the, at the body. I, I would have liked to see them a bit narrower, but the implant crowns went in and you'll see that's her final insert. And she was thrilled. She was very happy, good color, you know, good aesthetics. Um, and, uh, basically this is the three year post-op and you'll still see that papilla right there. I mean, again, we're being very picky, but, um, that was because of a suture. Can you imagine? right? So um, that's what's possible with immediates. Uh, let's go to a complex one. Okay, that was fairly challenging, but what do you do when you open up this? This is the same case I showed you. The patient had the one, two endo done, and then basically, you know, had this infection later on that was deemed due to a fracture in the canine after a CT. So once the site was open, you'll see there's a huge defect, huge defect, like monster defect. So what do we do in this case? 
right? We graft it, right? Wrong. We place an implant. Where our goal here is to engage the cortical bone. You see the, where the floor of the nose meets the anterior wall, the sinus? That's a really nice sweet spot. You'll know you're there when you start drilling and you start getting some resistance. And you start pushing a little bit more. That's how you know you're in that sweet spot. And then you place the implant. One key point when drilling with cortical bone, unlike regular maxillary bone, you can under prep a half a milliliter, it works fine. With cortical bone, oftentimes you have to prep to the same size of the implant. Otherwise that implant will not be able to jump the gap in cortical, cortical bone, if you get what I mean. So it's you're really kind of taking a chance there because you may over prep, right? So you gotta be really careful the way you prep and this is something that we teach um, you know, uh, to uh, the doctors that, that are part of our study club, so or who come and observe surgery. So there's the implant, it goes in, and of course, guess what? She wanted a tooth the same day. So we grafted in our usual fashion, autogenous bone on the threads. Okay, and where do we collect the bone? We typically collect it right here. There's a nice canine prominence right up here. We can scrape some bone, put some there, then some sticky bone on top, collagen membrane, PRF membranes, and then we put this all back, right? Okay, we close this up. And again, I wouldn't use polypropylene anymore, or proline anymore. I'd use like a 5 monocryl. And then we make the tooth for her. So we put a temporary abutment, um, you know, we trim it, we make the temporary crown, and then there's the final uh, post-op. Uh, and here is her, her four-month, or sorry, five-month post-op. You can see everything's regenerated very well. So there's her before and there's her after um, with the bone. I think there's ample bone there to support the crown. I still have not received any pictures of the final crown for my referral yet. So what about, um, let's turn it up again. <laughs> what if we have a case that's highly aesthetic? So uh, Dr. Mary Stegman in 2006 came out with this flap design called the aesthetic buckle flap. You know, many of you are aware of it, but it works amazingly well to preserve tissue, okay? Um, this was probably not the best case to do it in initially because I thought, so this is actually um, one of my doctors in our study club. And so um, she had come, had uh, an endo done on the 2-2, I think multiple times in apical, and basically the tooth was deemed non-restorable. And she came to me, she said, Azim, I need your help. Um, I cannot work with a denture for my front tooth. There's no option here. What can you do for me? I said, well, if you trust me, I think, we can, I, think I can help you. I think we can do this case. Um, why? Because I saw that there was some buckle bone here. So I said, okay, you know what? Let's try to maintain that buckle bone. And I think we can because the tooth has a small root. Well, unfortunately what happened, and when I made my aesthetic buckle flap over the tutu, my goal was just to access this apical lesion. When I made this cut, I discovered that there was no bone here. There was no bone. And then I looked on the root of the tooth and it was on the tooth. So now there's no bone here. So now what do I do? And the lesion was massive, right? We took out this whole area, it was uninfected. So I went ahead, place my implant in the same manner, except here and now, we need a barrier for our bone. So I trimmed a membrane, okay? And I don't know if you can see the picture here, it's a little bit hard, but I trimmed it so it actually came up under the soft tissue where the bone was gone, missing as well. And we trimmed it, we placed autogenous bone on the threads of the implant, covered this back up, folded this back up, and then sutured, so put some PRF as well. Of course, you have to release the tissue properly, and Tina talked a bit about the periosteal release on Friday. And then we sutured this back up. This is 5 monochrome. And now, of course, we're making a temp. So this is all bone. This is aloe, xeno bone, tons of it. It's bulked up right to the margin of the tissue. The membrane's just tucked right underneath here. And this is fairly challenging to do. And then we'll go ahead and make an immediate temp crown, which will just compress that site. So after a week, she calls me back. She says, oh, my God, it's failing. And she sends me this picture. And I go, you know what? Don't worry, that's okay. That's probably just the PRF. Meanwhile, remember I got my mom, right? I call out my mom, I'm like, mom, can you please play for Dr. So-and-so? She's like, got you, buddy, got you, okay? So three weeks later, the prayers worked, right? Okay, um, biology healed. Everything turned out pretty good for her. Um, she still has a little bit of a scar, but that actually was from her apoplectomy. And so um, uh, that's the soft tissue. And she had came back because she's, you'll notice she still has a denture because she's missing some more teeth on her upper left.
So now um, regenerated right to the crest of that area. Okay, so, and it looks very similar to native bone, even though I know there's a mix of xeno in there too, it's 50-50. But that just is phenomenal, right? So the power of using an immediate implant to help stabilize things or help stabilize even the, 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 the bone grafting or help stabilize the membrane, I think really, really helps. Again, you have to put your implant in the optimal position and, and you have to support and close the site properly. And that means primarily, right, tension free. So here's another case. Again, we're going to turn it up. I call this one extreme, okay, because this patient was a hygienist with a high smile line with a 2-1 that had an, uh, uh, a fistula or I guess an infection. And the result of this infection was due to external resorption, which had then affected the mesial of the lateral as well. And so she came as a referral from her dentist and she said, I've seen specialists multiple and they all said we need to take this tooth out and graft and you need a flipper or whatever she said i heard i know you do immediate what can you do for me so again i said okay well here we go there's a huge defect you can see the whole lateral is exposed okay and you'll see again the axial slice shows a resorption and the buckle is exposed as well so the goal here was to use an aesthetic buckle flap atraumatically extract the central and you can see the resorption right here expose the site nice and clean and properly and thoroughly debride the lateral okay from there we place our implant in the optimal position staying about two to three millimeters away from the adjacent tooth and then we go ahead and you'll see the distance here is maintained two to three millimeters from the adjacent root and then we'll use emdegain many of you know of emdegain as a product that's used for vertical defects and for perio but or, or even uh, so i i decided let's coat the side of the lateral with emdegain, okay? And then went ahead and did my grafting. So we grafted this defect on the buckle and then covered it using a collagen membrane. Um, and that collagen membrane was being stabilized by the flap. So I just sutured the membrane to the apical portion of the flap. Again, it's not, it's a little bit more complex to do that. And then we sutured up the site, okay? Once the site was sutured, then we went ahead and just made our temporary crown like we always do. Okay, so this was the two month post op check. And again, you can see things are healing actually really nicely. We didn't touch the margin of her tissue, so which was really important to me and her. And you'll see we have a little bit of embedded bone, but look at the soft tissue volume. Beautiful. And look at the margin. So we then went ahead and uh, just made her her final crown, right? So this one had to be a, a cement retained crown. Just I was not able to get the implant in a screw retained position, um, but that's her final crown. And that's four months later. And I think I have her three year later. There's her three year later post op. Okay, and it still looks really good. So let's turn it up even more. What do you do when you have a patient who has multiple lesions in the anterior? One of those lesions is associated with an impacted supernumerary tooth stuck in the patient's floor of the nose. Welcome to my life. <laughs> okay, so. Same way, same principles, what I decided to do was atraumatically take out the teeth, do a large aesthetic buckle flap, trying to stick with the contours of the papilla, okay, just so that I would have even amounts of tissue in the area. Now you can see there it is. Now I'm, I'm, I'm into the nasal spine here, right up to the floor of the nose. This is a huge flap, okay? Now I'm trying to section this tooth out, and I sectioned it out. The problem here, if you notice in the CT, is the crown is apical. So the crown is wider than the root. So to take this tooth out, the only way I won't, I can only take out the root. Otherwise, I'd really have to get into the nasal floor, and I didn't want to get into that. So I took out as much of the tooth as I could. I then prepared the sites, and by the way, there was not a lot of bone to begin with in these sites. So these are just the preps, okay? The bone was very thin. You had some nice apical concavities in these areas. Implants get placed, and now I'm using tacks. And these are tacks, I think these are Meisinger tacks that we used, and then double two collagen membranes. Why did I separate these? Because there's the nasal spine, and it gets in the way. So uh, it, it kind of tend, it gets in the way. So I like to keep them separate when I'm working on each side. Uh, now we go ahead and we add bone, we put our membranes over top, we put our PRF, and then we suture that all back up. Okay, and now for this case, because I didn't get primary stability on this implant and these implants, again, it was a larger site. I decided just to graft this and the patient left like this 
with an Essex retainer, okay? For five months, we kept them in an Essex. Um, this is actually the three month, uh, sorry, the uh, two week, um, two month post-op, okay? And this is the five month post-op. So you can see everything's healed really well. Here's the CBCT, just to confirm, I wanted to see what the bone looked like. And you'll notice um, everything actually looked really, really good. So this is the one, one site, again, the anterior site. We've got some pretty good bone here. In the one, two site, again, we've got some pretty good bone. There's the pin. Um, in the two, one, sorry, in the two, two site, which is over here, you'll still see there's a little bit of that crown, but I'm okay with that. Okay, I'm not, I'm actually not in that area anyways with the implant, so I'm okay. And then there's the actual implant itself. Okay. So this is the final prosthetic that was made by the referring dentist. So again, with immediates, if we can get some good stability, good access and debridement, I think we can get really good success. Again, these are not easy cases. What if we turn it up even more? So now again, a patient presents 22 years old, large infection, no buccal bone. The CT shows clearly there's a small hole, would you say? Big hole in the bone. So for this case, again, we follow it. We take it out, we take the tooth out atraumatically and I'm trying to maintain whatever natal, natal bone I can. Having this access allows proper debridement. And that's what it stated in the study, was get good debridement. Now we place our implant in the optimal position. We then go ahead and graft. Okay, in this case actually was done with simultaneous crown lengthening for the lateral. Um, and we suture, and this was the six-month post-op. So you'll see the bone has been regenerated, and now we've got nice soft tissue, um, and there's a CT afterwards. Again, some great bone volume, um, and now we're just taking an impression, um, and oh, I don't, it doesn't look like I have the final crown in there, but we actually did two crowns here, so sorry, guys. Okay, um, what about insanity? How do we define insanity? Insanity is where you have something like this where you have a hole that goes through and through. And I showed you guys this case. So you'll notice here, my criteria is I need a little bit of bone to engage my implant. And it's right up here, right apically. So, the, and you'll see here, there's the fistula right on the palatal. It's a little bit hard to see here. Again, it might be not the best video quality for you guys, but uh, hopefully it is. So the goal is to expose all the sites thoroughly, debride them thoroughly, including the palatal aspect, okay? And you'll see the hole goes right through the buckle, all the way through the lingual soft tissue, completely through. So once we, and this is the floor of the nose, okay, so there's the floor of the nose. I like to expose that as well, just so that I can see where my implant is gonna engage into. And even for extreme, for more extreme cases, like all on, we'll do nasal lifting. Well, I'll actually lift the floor of the, uh, of the, the nasal mucosa to, to accommodate the implant. Um, but this case, we didn't need to do that. So we're placing our implant in the optimal position mesial distal and buccolingual. You'll see we want cingulum access here. So there's the implant. Okay, you can see there's quite a bit of bone loss here as well on the adjacent lateral. Um, there's the autogenous bone using that micro os as I mentioned. Um, and here is a collagen membrane, okay? I'm putting a collagen membrane on the palatal as well because I wanna block cells from proliferating into the bone graft palatally as well. Okay, so there's one on the palate, just fold it up, and now there's gonna be two on the buckle. There's one, there's two. One is apical, one is stabilized by the healing above. Now we're gonna add some bone, we're gonna put some PRF membranes, we're gonna suture this, and of course, in usual fashion, make our screw retain temporary crown. Okay, so there's a five month post-op check. There's a soft tissue, again, sorry, this was taken with the mouthwatch camera, but it's still good, all right, it's still shows. And then there's a post-op CBT, CBCT at five months. You'll see some nice bone volume regeneration, even palatally. That palatal defect is completely closed. Okay, and that's again because we follow the same principles of GBR by using a membrane on the palatal and actually I doubled up the membrane on the buckle. Okay, there is the final crown for the patient, screw retained. Okay, now I call this one mucho insane. I don't know, all of a sudden I became Mexican, but anyways. Um, this case I just did not too long ago, but what do you do when you have a patient who needs two centrals to be extracted and has a high smile line, right? What do you do in that scenario? So what happened in this patient's case is the one, one had a fracture and had a huge apical lesion that actually there, uh, had, had, had gone through the buckle plate here. The two, one was endotreated, had a vertical and horizontal fracture and huge bone loss and buccal dehiscence as well. So for this patient, 
again, not to complicate things, but she was also going through currently right now, and Samaya, you know this, um, is she's going through uh, um, Invisal uh, sorry, Invisalign. So how do we maintain retention during the surgical phase here, right? So of course, uh, what I did for her is well, we made her an S6 after we did this treatment, which I'll show you. So this is the treatment plan. There's the implant for the one one. The goal was we were placing two implants here. Now to maintain papilla is extremely difficult. This is something that relies on a very good, well-informed patient consent options saying we shouldn't do this. If we did do this, let's do one tooth at a time. Everything is very extensive. The patient is well aware of what we're gonna be doing. So this was a surgical site. It was a hot mess, okay? We did two vertical releasing incisions away from the site where we plan on grafting, had good access. This is the infection, by the way, that I'm removing from the one one site, or the central site, okay? And this is the, these are the defects that were left. They were huge. What I was able to do, and I knew I would do by careful evaluation of the CT, was maintain the interproximal bone peak. And once you can do that, then what I did was I placed the implants. You'll see there's even exposure of the lateral here, okay? Because both of the teeth were affected by this infection. She had this infection, I think, for at least three, maybe three years, maybe more. We don't know. Um, but it's been a while. Um, so those are the implants, okay? They went in. And uh, you'll see there's fairly large defects, okay? But we got great stability on the implants, again, using a good implant design. Um, those are the temporary crowns. And now what I like to do in aesthetic cases is just block that out. They do make white temporary abutments as well, but I don't like them. I like the metal ones. Um, we block that out with some white opaque. And now we'll go ahead and make the temps. Now, one thing I would, I like to do, encourage is to make sure that you keep, if you're doing something like this, which again, I would highly say not to, unless you have good, great, a lot of experiences to maintain at least four to five millimeters from the interproximal bone to where your temp goes. Now, what I should have done in hindsight is maybe even go more, maybe even go higher to give that room for that papilla, but that's something you can adjust later on as well. Okay, there are the temporary crowns, okay, with the membrane on, and there is my usual bone grafting, so autogenous bone on the threads, then we put sticky bone and PRF, and then we suture this case up. The suturing is extremely important. Okay, these are vertical mattresses. This is with monochrome. Typically, resorption time on these is about two to three weeks. Okay, it's a fibro monochrome. And then um, there are some sling sutures here as well that you can't see. And there's even an apical mattress as well. Okay, and then we close the verticals. So the verticals, one hint when you do verticals is I like to use an oblique suture. So, um, you know, from the free tissue, I like to start apically and then I exit out the fixed tissue, which is more chromely, and then that pulls the tissue more chromely and it keeps it there. Okay, so that's the final. And then this is her three week post-op and so far so good. Um, what I'd like to see more of is here. I'd like to see this come down a bit more. And I know I can do that because I will actually see her. Well, now I can't see her, but when I can see her, I will adjust these temps because there is interproximal bone there, okay? So this is again, a more extreme uh, case um, with two implants. Um, and, and again, I wouldn't advise doing it um, unless you really feel confident with your surgical skill. Um, here's mucho insane. Now, for some reason, there's some red writing on my, uh, I don't know how to get rid of that red writing. I did not put it there. Maybe, well, whatever, we'll leave it there. Um, okay, so this is mucho insane, which basically means there is a huge hole, okay? And we know that once we place these implants, there's gonna be zero bone around them. So there's a defect, there's the implant. Okay, and I kind of, after I placed this implant, I kind of looked at myself like, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> okay, um, but this patient was really, like the expectations for this patient were extremely low. And I think having, I will say that right now, you need to manage your patient expectation. I mean, when you do these types of cases or you chant any immediate case or any case that you do for that matter, if you manage your expectation, um, because any complaint that comes to the college is always because of lack of management. Uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of, of the patient's expectations. So this patient knew that, listen, we're gonna do this, and most likely we'll fall apart, but he's like, listen, I need this done as soon as possible, like every patient does. That. So we just grafted a ton of sticky bones, probably a good three cc's in there. Okay, double membrane, closure, this is using the continuous interlocking suture, and then we also had some horizontal mattresses in here, and some single sling, and I don't know, maybe some, some, some I don't know, whatever else I could throw in there in the office. Um, so this is the sutured site, 
three weeks later, oh, sorry, two weeks later, um, you can see we trimmed the partial. That was his temp. And so this is the five month post-op check. You can see that was the initial treatment plan and that's what it looks like now. Okay, so we had some really good bone regeneration because again, we followed the principles of GBR, which is you know trying to get primary closure, uh, tension free, which I think is super important. And so now we're ready for our stage two surgery. So all of you know of something called a buckle roll flap, which I felt was appropriate to do for the right side, which is the one two. For the two two, I wasn't happy with the quality of the tissue. Okay, so I wanted more soft tissue. So the, what I did was a modified buccal roll flap, which I had learned from Dr. Stegman, which is basically taking incisions, full thickness, all the way from the buccal right to the palatal. Okay, right through the palatal on both sides. And then a partial thickness on the occlusal. And what you're trying to do here is once you make the partial thickness, you then do a split thickness and you open up the palatal flap. There's like this palatal little flap and you're grabbing the underlying palatal tissue and you're bringing it out. There it is. And there's the, the palatal flap, I just put it back. And now you're tucking that underneath the implant. So I have like that palatal tissue right here. This was taken from the palatal and this is on the buckle. So now I double fold this underneath and I suture it. Okay, and what that does is it gives us even more volume. Look at that, like tons, like a lot more volume. And you can actually do this as a, you can do this as many times as you want. You can put a cover screw back on, suture it, and then do it again. Okay, but it's a nice way to gain additional soft tissue volume. So this is the temp bridge, and then the patient went, I made the temp, and then the patient went and had the final bridge, which I still don't have pictures for. Okay? So lower anteriors, I think, are an important area that we all do, and you know, we see challenges with, because we, we see a lot of peri in the lower anterior. So this is the case where the patient had, again, some infection. So the same principles, although in lower anterior, you got to remember there's that mentalis muscle. So you have to be extremely cautious and careful with reflection in that area because once you suture back, you don't want tension from that area. So if you can avoid it altogether, that's ideal. Um, here I made two small little verticals, two mini verticals, just maybe a couple millimeters past the mucogingival junction. Um, I uh, removed uh, the tooth, okay, debrided the site very thoroughly. You can see it's all nice and clean here. It's all nice and white, okay? and then place the implant to the proper depth. The implant is about four to five millimeters apical to the CEJ. And then we're using our, we make a temporary abutment here, and then we make a temporary crown. The power with the mediates is being able to use your temporary, you're using your implant, which is stable, to hold your temporary abutment, which is then holding your membrane. Membrane stabilization, which then stabilize, then goes over the graft is one of the hardest things to do. How many people hate working with a membrane? Okay, so once you have something that you can stabilize it onto, it really, really helps. Okay, so this case, I did use some uh, monocryl as well, uh, just to close these using obliques. Okay, so apical, so free to fix, and then I actually put some periacryl, um, which I'm not a big fan of anymore, but if I do put it, I will try to put it away from the grafting site or in the suture site as well. And so that's the soft tissue afterwards, that's about four months later. Okay, and then there's the final crown. And then we wanted to just assess the bone and uh, everything looks pretty good. We were able to regenerate some pretty decent bone on the buckle of that. Okay, um, this patient came, of course, with a monster defect in the anterior. And she actually, I had told her that we really needed to remove the laterals or, you know, just, well, it was a long story. I actually posted this case on Facebook as well. So you guys can check it out. Um, but in this case, uh, and she also had a freedom. This thing, this case had everything going wrong for it. Okay, but she was adamant she wanted a tooth. She signed the consent. We reviewed very low expectations. I reviewed things with her dentist as well. And so what I did first for this case was use a soft tissue diode and we did a phrenectomy. And the phrenectomy was not a deep phrenectomy. It was a more shallower phrenectomy because I did not want to get into the area of the actual flap um, that I'm going to have made or that I'm going to actually perform. So when doing the flap, I have this small microblade. It's available um, by Salvin. Uh, one of my colleagues had gifted it to me. Thank you, Lydia. And these are super tiny microblades. You can use in areas where very fragile tissue. Make a nice clean flap. I expose the site. Okay, and there's, there should be no communication between your freedom and your flap. So again, these are more challenging cases to do. Um, and now we're prepping our, uh, our implant like we normally do. Getting stability of the implant. Okay, this is a three millimeter size implant. It's a grade five titanium, but it's still, and it's aggressive enough that it'll still get, you still get some good um, grab with this implant. 
Um, and grade five means it's stronger because obviously it's a more narrow diameter. Um, now the challenge is of course making the temporary crown. So this is a temporary abutment, we trimmed it, same usual fashion, using the healing abutment to stabilize the collagen membrane and then adding bone and suturing this back up. Okay, maintaining the soft tissue as high as we can. So this is the two week post-op and I think it looks really good. Oral hygiene for this patient is crucial. Okay, so we have to monitor this patient very carefully. We have to make sure she's doing a good job with her oral hygiene, uh, which clearly she wasn't. This is why she ended up in this situation. Um, and then this is the picture I got from my dentist because uh, the patient was in for her two month cleaning. Um, and she's doing a pretty good job maintaining things uh, in the area and so far so good, okay? Um, so now moving on to premolars, um, you know, it's a very common tooth, you know, nobody, everybody has immediate anterior, immediate premolar, what about uh, immediate molar, but what about immediate premolar? So um, when we have a case that's a little bit more complex and I showed you a simple one, this case actually was a bit unique in the sense that there was a fairly large palatal defect. And, you, and so um, the palatal wall was completely gone. So when I opened up this site and exposed this site, there's no palatal bone here at all, okay? There's also a huge hole from where I took out this tooth. So how do I stabilize the implant? Well, the goal here, and this is a trick that I use for medians, is I'll use a drill like the cast drill from the cast kit, okay? And I'll start drilling until I get right through the sinus floor, okay? Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rely on that apical area, that cortical bone that you can feel, and I'm under, under prepping it initially to see how it fits. And I'm also using the mesial and the distal walls right here to help wedge the implant in place. So there's that shot and boom. Okay, it goes in and now you'll see it's wedged here. It's wedged here. You do have to prepare the site a little bit. You don't really, what you have to be is at one with the bone. I don't know how to describe it. Maybe we should have like a meditation course on how to become one with the bone. But that's what you need to do. You need to play around with bone. That's where implants become fun and exciting, is how are you gonna get this implant stable in the site where you want it? So once it's stable and we have a good torque, this one was torqued at like 50. Once you hit cortical bone, you get a torque of like 100. Okay, you get a great torque on the implant. Now we follow the same protocol. Here what I did was I lined the paddle tissue with one membrane. We added sticky bone and somatogenous bone I didn't have actually, so I just put sticky bone. And then I put another collagen membrane that was held on to the healing abutment and I folded that over my, the, the first collagen membrane. So you'll see there's one here going this way and then there's one here covering the bone as well. And then this site was sutured and we tr I tried to get as best primary closure that I could. And the way you can do that is you can thin your palatal flap if you want, almost like taking a CTG. Okay, but you do your best to get that closure and anywhere that's exposed, I like PRF exposed. You'll see here's PRF. These are the PRF membranes that are kind of almost tissue punch, almost like a poncho. You know, we put them over top. So you'll see there's the membrane and then there's the PRF membrane that's tissue punched on top. And then we suture that side up and then we let that heal, okay? And then once we let that heal, there's the final, the final soft tissue, there's the final crown. And then we always take a CBCT in these, in these more difficult cases. And you'll see we've got some Really nice buckle bone. We're getting close to perforating in the, in the apical region here. Um, but when I was drilling, I was checking that. And uh, also we got some pretty decent palatal bone here as well. So a patient's happy in you know, five months, she's got her five final crown. And uh, these ISQ'd at over 80 as well, okay? Um, you know, I would have liked to see this over a little bit, but I was actually just sticking to the existing um, uh, socket that I was using uh, the dimension, okay? And so uh, what do you do in a case of a molar situation now, where you have little to no apical bone, because I just said, listen, you need apical bone, right? But in this case, it's even worse. You don't only have apical bone, but you don't have enough room or height to actually fit the implant in. So if the sinus was higher up, and I had enough height to put in a 10 millimeter implant, even an eight and a half, from where the implant needed to be positioned, okay, which would be, let's say right here, to where the sinus floor was, then you don't need to do any sinus lifting, right? You can just grab the implant where it is, the implant will be placed at, the, at a nice position and then go, go for it. But in these cases, you need to sinus lift because there's not enough height for where the implant needs to go. So you'll see here, here's the plan, uh, the implant plan, this was from Canaray and it shows that, that there's just not enough height. Where I need to put my implant is right here at the septum and there's not enough height. So I have to lift the sinus. So how do we do that? Immediately, right? So what I like to do is I like to section the tooth and remember not all upper molars 
section in three. Some upper molars, they'll have the distal buccal and the palatal root joint. So this is the importance of a CT. Once I section that, I will create a nice flat plane to expose the interproximal bone or interceptal bone, I should say. Okay, once I do that, I'll use my cast kit and you can use Densa as well. Just they're fairly expensive. So I like to stick to my cast kit and I find my cast kit is a lot, is a lot more predictable. And now with the cast kit drill, it's beautiful because it won't cut the membrane. It has stoppers and you're also collecting a Taj's bone, which between me and you, I keep on the drills as I'm using my next stopper, as I go deeper and deeper, I keep that autogenous bone on. So now once I access the floor of the sinus, I then go ahead and put my hydraulic lifter into this site and I lift it, okay, and I apply pressure. The smaller amount of residual bone, the smaller the hole you should keep. Why? Because you will get more pressure when you do your hydraulic lift, okay? So then once I do my hydraulic lift, I insert PRF, I then add my bone graft material. Remember, the tooth is still in, and that tooth, remember, still has an infection, by the way. There's an apical lesion. Now, once my bone graft is in, I then go ahead and I remove the roots. Why? Because I don't want to remove the roots early and then per have a perforation in the sinus from the extraction of the roots. Okay, so leaving them in, then going ahead, and um, this is the hydraulic. So here's a video, and many of you who've been on the YouTube, uh, sorry, on the Facebook page have seen, all the videos look the same. There's a membrane, you can actually see it. Okay, and then I, I, I like to leave a bit of saline in there and get the patient to breathe in and out. So there's a membrane right there. You can see it just sitting there nicely and it's been lifted nicely. Um, and now we can add bone in there. And I like sticky bone again, it just stays like a clump. It's a little bit harder to compact, but you can do it. And so once we add our bone, I'll take a PA just to see. I can see some nice bone volume above. Um, we'll put our implant in. And then I'll pack bone into the sockets as well, right up to the margin of the soft tissue. Use my healing abutment, wide healing abutment, a six or seven millimeter wide with PRF on it. And then just suture the side back up. And I pretty much almost have primary closure. I mean, it's closed up pretty good. So there's the uh, PA and there's the volume of the soft tissue. Okay, that's four months post-op. All right, that's four months post-op. And that's a single step, single surgery, the final crown after five months. And then there's the CBCT. You can see this is the new sinus floor right here. And this bone is probably still healing, right? That bone is still regenerating. But we had an ISQ value of 72 on this one, 72. So um, uh, I was ready to load. Okay, and then there's the final PA. And again, you can see the depth has allowed us to create a really nice emergence profile with good biological width. That's the goal. That's what we're going for on all of our cases. Okay, what about a case where you have, so some doctors say, well, I mean, you can't do every case immediate molar. Uh, an immediate, right, for every molar. What if there's infection, right? What if there's a big abscess? And the answer is maybe you can't, but it is possible, okay? And again, if you follow systematic technique. So here's, an, here's the case, large infection. The nerve's fairly far away. We've got some good apical bone that we can probably use to grab onto. And oftentimes for an immediate molar, you'll find the ideal position is almost sits in the mesial root, at the apex of the mesial root. Um, it's not in the septum, um, right? Because you want to be in between the contact points. So here is the defect and the height of the defect, okay, is, uh, is about three millimeters, three to four millimeters. And so there's the implant positioning. So that's the tooth, okay? You can see multiple fractures. It was a nightmare to get out. In fact, I, the roots kept breaking and breaking. So actually I decided to just take out the mesial root because as I was drilling, I was hitting the mesial curvature of the root. And then I kept the distal root in so I had something to still kind of slide along, right? So it kept, keeps your drill in the same position. Now I'm checking with my drill, am I good, you know, buccolingually, my good mesodistal. Once I finish my hole, I then go ahead and remove properly the roots. I check to confirm my osteotomy is at the right depth. And then I place my implant. This is a wide-bodied implant, a six millimeter implant. Okay, and again, good position. And then we graft, just like we do before. Okay, on the lower, I like to decorticate. On the upper, you don't need to, um, uh, because the, you know, the cortical plate is not as thick, but uh, you know, it's neither here nor there. Um, now we have uh, you know, some nice sticky bone. We have the healing abutment, which is stabilizing the membrane. And now we go ahead and add a nice volume of, of, of sticky bone, um, put some uh, fold the membrane over top. Again, collagen, mem uh, sorry, PRF membranes over that. And then we suture the site back up, okay? And again, the key here is releasing the site properly. So there's the drills. You'll see uh, the, the mesial root was kind of getting in the way. So I, I had to remove it to continue my drilling. Okay, 
And then, um, and then there's the implant placed in the optimal position. There's the two month post stop check. Okay. And then there is the four month uh, CBCT four month post op. Okay. And now I would like to see actually more bone here. And I know I can get it um, by doing a couple of different uh, variation on, on that technique. Um, I would have actually liked to do a free gingival graft here as well because I had about three millimeters. So I like, I like to have a little bit more, um, but she decided not to do that. Um, she declined. So there's the final crown. Okay, and I think for her it turned out really well. After four months, she got her final crown. Um, here's a similar case again, except with a larger defect in the buckle. And so my go-to, this is a more current case. This is a more recent case. This is pretty much how I do it now. Um, again, there's a buckle dehiscence. We can see it very clearly. So in some cases, if I feel like I can just get the tooth out, I'll get the tooth out. Um, but for beginners, I like them to still keep the roots in to help them use, otherwise your drills kind of slip around here, right? So making the hole, putting it in the optimal position, okay, um, is really important. Again, I'm centered in between the contact points. Um, and now exposing this defect. So what I like to do is, um, uh, and I will say what I like to do, okay? <laughs> and, uh, so I do have experience in, you know, reflecting the mental nerve, dissecting mental nerve, going on top of the neurovascular bundle. These things I feel comfortable with doing. So I don't, I didn't have a problem reflecting a flap in the premolar region with the vertical, but I would encourage you all not to do that until you feel, until you have adequate training. Okay. So um, in this case, I had reflected a flap with a vertical in between the two premolars, which is a big no-no. Sorry, Tina. Um, but, uh, but again, I felt comfortable doing it because I'm used to working and exposing the mental nerve and, and releasing around that neurovascular bundle very safely. Um, so uh, once I made that vertical, I had good access. I was able to see the site, the defect very, very clearly. Okay, to bride it very nicely, place my implant in the optimal position, and then bone graft the exact same way and close this up. Okay, and by closing this up, I closed up the vertical as well. So I don't have a picture of that. Um, and then that's what the implant looked like afterwards. This is the one week post-op. Okay, so we removed the sutures at three weeks. So there's a three week post-op and things are healing pretty good. This is the two month post-op. All right, and everything looks good. And this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for this nice volume of bone. When you put your finger on this, it's like a huge bone. Like it's a huge hill of bone. Okay, and which is great. And I know this is going to look beautiful. And and we'll have more bone than we did on that initial case that I showed you, okay? Um, so uh, what about an upper? Because upper, the concern is obviously the sinus, right? And so here, we do have some pretty good height. You'll see, here's a septum, and here's the floor of the sinus. So we have some pretty decent height to work with to position our implants. We don't necessarily need to sinus lift here, okay? Or oh, sorry, actually, sorry, this is a wrong case I'm talking about. This one, we do need to sinus lift, sorry. Okay, so there's not enough bone here. So... We're gonna do the same thing, but the problem here was that there was a massive infection around one root. So I came up with a unique idea. I figured, you know what? There's better bone in between these two roots than right where I wanna make my osteotomy, correct? This is all black and this is white. So I decided, let me go a little bit further distal and do my lift here, all right? So you'll see I'm a bit more distal and I did my lift in this area because there was better bone quality. So once I did my lift, okay, and this case had a, had a large defect on the buckle as well, then I actually re-prepared this site into the ideal position using, again, my castro. So I, this site was only used to actually lift, do my lift, and then I went back and I put my implant in the proper ideal site. Again, more challenging, but it's possible. And again, these, this hole is no more than, I would say maybe three mil, two, two and a half millimeters. So it's not gonna compromise the stability of the implant normally. It doesn't if you do it right and you take out these roots atraumatically and there's still bone left over, okay? So now we place our implant and you'll see, look at the lift here. It's huge. I don't know if you guys can see that, but it's nice, uh, a nice even lift right across. I, I like to add up to three cc's of saline. I just inject it all in. Uh, well, I go in and out, in and out, just like, you know, the protocol tells you to do. So we place our implant, we graft this area, and then we suture it up. And, uh, and then there's the uh, healing of the site. Um, and I did graft the buckle as well. You can see kind of where the flap was reapproximated. Um, and that's the before. Okay, and then this is the after. Again, we had maybe done about maybe two, three millimeter lift here. And we got a nice 10 millimeter implant in that area. Okay, um, this is the case that uh, I was uh, showing you. I called, I was talking about, which I call insane. Okay, 
Um, again, do not try these at home, okay? But this case, you'll see ample apical bone, okay? The problem is if you look closely, it's very trabeculated and it was like cottage cheese. It was very, very soft. But there's cortical bone way up here. So my goal was to use, place an implant where the, the, the coronal aspect of the implant needs to be where it needs to be. It can't be too deep. And the apical aspect, I wanted it to hit the cortical bone. So I take that measurement, and in my office, I have you know, seven millimeter implants, eight, eight and a half, 10, 11 and a half, 13, 15 and 18 millimeter implants, and every, every size, every stock. I mean, you have to have a stock of these implants when you're doing immediates. So for this case, by the time I flapped this case, you can see the size of the defect was enormous. At that point, I told the patient, I think it's better that we just graft. And he said, you know what? I would, I, and, and the consent said, you know, I want to try that. I said, you know, I don't think we should do this. He said, no, you know, I have confidence that you can do it. And I want to try this. And I know worst case scenario, I'll be back here taking out implants. I said, fine. So now I'm taking my drill and I'm trying to find some cortical bone here. Okay. So I go ahead. I finally find some cortical bone. I prepped that with my, with my cast drill. And now I engage my implant and my implant actually torqued to about 32 newtons, which was phenomenal. Okay, this patient we were doing two implants for, one in the upper right first molar, for those Americans, I won't say the, uh, the, US, the, the coding, so upper right first molar and upper second first molar. Um, I did use a TAC, this is also from NC Bio, and uh, to hold a membrane, to hold the membrane, so there it is, stabilizing the membrane. Uh, actually, in stock, I didn't have a large enough membrane to cover this whole site. I only had 15 by 20, so that's a key point. Make sure you have enough stock. Okay, otherwise I would have probably taken a 30 by 40 and covered this whole thing right up and use my healing buttons to do that. Okay, but here I had to use my tack um, and then I sutured this whole thing back up. Okay, so I got some double simple interrupted sutures and then we, I went back with some monocryl as well. But this is cytoplast. Cytoplast actually is my go-to suture. 4 cytoplast, it's a PTFE monofilament. Okay, and then 5 monocryl is my other go-to suture for areas, especially like in mucosa. Um, so now we graph this whole thing and you can see there's a huge defect. I told the patient they're probably, probably going to need an endo on the 1.5. They knew that in advance. Um, so we grafted this whole area. There's the 1.5, one and a half month post-op check. And you can see, look at the volume of bone here. Okay. in the soft tissue. Again, with good release, good suturing and good GBR, um, with immediate implants, we can, you can achieve, or one can achieve these results. Um, fairly predictably. And these are like not cases that I'm showing you like one-offs. I mean, I have a whole list of like, 550 cases step by step and they all look very similar um, with good healing good bone volume there's the bone volume on the ct and remember i have a ct i can check right i can check a year two years or even post-op um, there is the implant you'll notice there's the one six look at where it's anchored floor of the nose okay um, and there's all the bone on the buckle and the lingual um, and then there's the one seven implant um, and these are the final crowns that he had inserted five months post-op i think it was five months yeah five months post-op okay I generally wait minimum four, typically. Well, minimum three and a half for most cases. Uh, for larger grafts, I typically wait about five months, okay? Um, again, another insane um, implant. What do you do when, okay, and here's a case, when the extraction socket is completely blown out? Okay, it's completely blown out. It's gone. And there's a sinus there. In this case, there's a nerve. So this patient was actually a referral of mine's best friend and terrified. So we had to do this under IV sedation. And she said, no matter what you do, get my implant in or try to get it in. And I'm okay if it fails because I'm only going to sleep once. And I know I may have to go to sleep again to take it out, but if it works, great. So these are cases that we're taking risks. Look at the size of the defect here apically, okay? And the issue is there's not a lot of bone between the apex and the nerve. Okay, now remember, I'd like to still keep my referral. I'd like to keep them referring. So I don't want to screw this case up. By the way, when she came in to see me to have the surgery done, there was now a perilous or an infection. So we do the same protocol. We section the tooth. Okay, I do my initial drilling, start my drilling. Problem is, I find that I'm hitting the, the root of a tooth. So I said, you know what, let me take out the distal root first. And now I try to take out, now I start prepping the site with my mesial root in, and I feel like now I'm hitting the mesial root. So now I try to remove the mesial root, and guess what? It cracks, and it cracks. You know why it keeps cracking? Because it's hooked underneath the septal bone that I need to keep 
to stabilize my implant. Oh, this drill's pretty close to the nerve too, by the way, right? So I don't know what to do at this point. She's asleep. I'm like, what the hell am I going to do? So the infection gets cleaned out. Everything gets cleaned out. I say, listen, you know what? Maybe I should just graft it, right? And then I go, wait a minute. Let's try this, okay? So let's enlarge the site just to the last drill. So I'm not going any deeper than where I was. And remember the Y factor. It's important to you to know. In my case, I know my Y factors for my drills are about 0.7 up to 1 millimeter. Enlarging this, under prepping still, and then I'm placing. So remember, there's zero stability here. Zero stability. There's nothing I can get stability with. So what I decided to do was to place sticky bone on the distal. Okay, the distal of the site. Then insert my implant with, so you have to take something sterile, put my cover screw on my implant, and then take a driver and put my implant in that area with cotton pliers. Okay. Then pack in sticky bone on the mesial. Then I would take my Unigrip driver and move the implant where I thought was the best position. As I kept that, my assistant would be compacting the sticky bone. Okay. And then we added more, I added more bone on top, covered this whole thing up with the collagen, two collagen membranes, and then PRF membranes. And then I sutured this whole thing up and I couldn't get primary closure. I mean, I could have, but I was really worried about moving the mucogingival junction that much. I was hoping, really relying on my PRF. So what happened? After three weeks, that's what it looked like. I said, oh God, you know, what's happening here? What's gonna happen? So we let this heal. And this was five, sorry, this was five and a half months later. Okay, soft tissue healed. Implant looked okay. So I decided let's do our stage two surgery. Okay, so I grabbed as much tissue as I could, keratinized tissue. Okay, did a buckle roll flap, just like I normally do. And when I torque tested this thing, there was bone covering the implant, by the way. Okay, so is primary stability overrated? Yeah, it is. Okay, would I go for it every single time? Absolutely. But okay, will implants still integrate without primary stability? Absolutely. Okay, I know that. I've done it many times. Not many times, but enough times to know that. I'm not getting failures, okay? So here's the implant. Okay, we put a healing abutment. We suture this, we let it heal, and look at the soft tissue. Okay, probably should have de-epithelialized there a little bit, but the soft tissue looks great. We then took an impression, and for this patient, I winded up having to make her her crown on the posterior tooth as well, but there's a soft tissue, and there's her in final implant crown. And this ISQ tested over 80 as well, okay? What about a case? <laughs> This one I call mucho insane. You're, you guys are thinking like, wow, that one was pretty off the chart. This one is a bit more off the chart. Massive infection. Patient was out of town. Um, desperate for an implant the same day. Um, vertical fracture. Huge infection. What the hell am I going to do for this patient? Okay. Clearly says there's no bone. Is there bone? Can you guys see the bone? Are you a bone finder? Okay, because it's right here. It's the apical cortical bone of the lingual plate, okay? And that, again, relies on expertise. So some people argued with me when I post this on Facebook saying, oh, you shouldn't do that. You're going to hit this and that. Well, listen, ICCTs of cases from myself, from GPs, from specialists with implants hanging in that area all the time. These look at when we're placing other implants. And these are just a few from cases that I took. So the goal here for me was to remove this, debride the site, great endo, by the way, debride the site, Okay, place my implant, and the way I place this is very carefully, using a rocking motion, not an in and out motion, with my cast drill, engaging the implant into that lingual cortical plate in the ideal position, and then going ahead and grafting it, okay, and, uh, and letting that heal. So there's a one-week post-op, there's a six-week post-op, and then there is our um, final soft tissue healing, and there's a CT. So you can see here, again, we're still within the alveolus, but we're engaged into that lingual cortical plate, and there's the final crown, okay? So um, premolar and molar extreme cases, again, I think I've belabored the point here, but when you have big holes, if you can stabilize the implants, and you can stabilize your graft, and then suture, and that's why I like healing abutments, it helps to get that closure, then you can, then I find I can gain some pretty nice predictable results um, with GBR and immediate implants, okay? Uh, I'm gonna skip over the CT guided stuff because I think, well actually I, I shouldn't, but for, for most of you who are thinking about getting into immediates and are worried about the positioning and being pulled by a socket, using CT guided surgery, this case was done CT guided, you can see all the sheets that are up here, 
um, completely CT guided. I think we had what, two, four, six, seven, eight implants that we're replacing. The entire case was done CT guided. Um, that can really help to maintain your position for your implants. Okay, and again, taking pictures and checking out your cases afterwards and allowing things to heal is important. Um, but you can also do freehand if you feel comfortable, right? With good CT, good implant positioning. And remember, you have sockets. They're generally normally in the right position, right? You can use those sockets. Um, they're oftentimes buckled, but the hole generally is in the right spot. Um, it, you know, if you can position the implant in the right spot, then again, you can, um, you can graft, as I mentioned, release the site and suture. And you can get some really nice, very nice, predictable um, results with the soft tissue, with the bone, and thereby shortening the treatment time so the patient now has, you know, now has a bridge, right? This is the final bridge, okay? Um, I'm actually going to, uh, so some people argue with me and say, you know, well, the casket, how do you know you're really lifting the sinus and you perforate it? Again, that's a whole, that's a half-day course that we teach, but this is a patient who was extremely concerned about crestal sinus lifting. And I said, fine, we'll go laterally. But I always try crestal first. So very little bone. My concern with this case was there was a branch. Well, you can see the artery right here from the PSA, right? So if I did a lateral approach, I'm worried that I'm going to get bleeding. So let's try a crestal. So I did the crestal. At the same time of the surgery, after I did my crestal and added my bone, I took a CT. So there was a CT before I placed my implant. And you can see we've got some great lift. We've got some great bone volume, almost nine. So now here I placed a 10 millimeter implant. Okay, so it is possible with good technique. You can even do multiple sites. So this is what I call a double sinus lift. Okay, where we're doing the same. We're doing the same thing in two sites. Uh, this site I did one site first. You can see I did this site first. Put the implant, added bone. Then I did the second site. That's why you see a little bit of uh, uh, darkness because probably we have some saline in there. But at the end of the day, it all fills in. Okay, the goal for sinus lifting is just space maintenance, right? You're just maintaining the space so that the, the bone can heal. Um, and there's a CT from that case. Um, when you have, again, minimal bone, you can do what I call double sites where you do a two hump camel, see the two humps, and again, lifting both the sites and placing implants. The residual bone in these cases are less than two millimeters, by the way. Okay, this case probably, here maybe we had about four, here at the back we had about two. So again, the crustal sinus lift can really do a lot, and look at the lift on these cases. Like This is the CT from that same case, it's huge. You get tons of bone. Okay, um, even when there's buccal defects, right? And the goal is when you lift, you just inject the saline, leave some in so the patient can breathe in and out. So you tell them to breathe out, now they breathe in. And this was supposed to be a, a lateral sinus lift, by the way, but I always try crustal first. Okay, and then we went, wind it up. You can see there's a huge buccal defect as well. So we're grafting in the sinus and we're grafting buccally as well. And by using the healing abutment, again, I don't need as much release of the tissue, right? Because um, you know, you have the healing above it that helps. You don't need to close as much and you don't need to do as much of a periosteal release as well. Okay. And then there's the post-op check. All right. Um, crestal versus lateral. Crestal is great, as I mentioned. Okay. With immediate implants, it helps. You're just going right through the hole. Um, okay. But with lateral, and there's the crestal here. I think this one I did by a Densa approach. Um, but uh, using um, a lateral, sometimes you have no option. You know, lateral technique is the only option. And I do do lateral as well. But again, there is the risk. You perforate. It's a larger surgery, you know, and I will still place implants. The beauty of, of the high Austin system is it has threads that go right to the top of the implant. So if I have a millimeter to a millimeter and a half of bone, I will still get about 20 to 30 Newton centimeter of stability on the implant just because there's that, that, that goes right to the crest. So there's the crestal approach. There's the... Um, the lateral, uh, sorry, the uh, lateral approach, and then there's the post-op as well, um, and uh, two months, okay? Um, what also has changed is obviously full arch, right? Full arch, being able to provide patients teeth the same day. So whether it's using angled implants, um, and for these cases, I, I will tell you, you need to have a good team. You have to have a team of people who know exactly what they're doing, an anesthesiologist, somebody who does conversion, whoever's doing the prosthetics, the surgeon, everybody's got to communicate with each other to understand what the goal is. And the goal is to have enough room uh, to, for the prosthetic and to, to, to improve the function of the patient. So this is her before, this is the after. Um, again, this was a case that was referred to me from Niagara, uh, a buddy of mine in Niagara, who patient had like mini implants and they all failed. 
Um, so having guides, you know, working with your, your, your team to either have CT guides, which I don't do full arch CT guided yet. Um, I do freehand, um, but I still get guides made. So you can see these are clear cutout guides that can tell me where my exit points need to be. They're clear duplicates. We even mark on here 15 millimeters so we know the prosthetic heights. Um, and then we, when we do the surgery, we know how much reduction we need. And then the implants just get placed. Um, these are, uh, you know, MUAs, so we had to use some 17 degrees here to get it out the access channel. Um, and then there's that immediate conversion that happens. What I love, love, love about fixed or full large case, especially for cases that don't have a lot of bone, is that literally that bone is stabilized and it doesn't move. Why? Because the prosthetic on top of it is fixed. So as opposed to putting in a denture, which now moves around, right? Or the patient can't wear the denture. So for me, if I have a severely resorbed case, I try to encourage an all on or like a, like a fully fixed immediate case so that I'm not jeopardizing my bone grafting. Okay, so this is the full arch. Um, that's the upper, um, uh, those are on six, six implants. So like I told you, the transition to six is, is I think widespread now. Not many are doing just four anymore. Um, and uh, again, these cases, we expose sinus, we expose dental nerve, so we know we're replacing the implants and this is the full arch uh, prosthetics, okay? Um, so teeth in a day can really be a game changer for those patients who don't want to walk out with a denture anymore. And you can get very good results, even on cases with multiple teeth, just using the bone and knowing where to place the implants is important and guides help experience obviously helps. Um, this is another full arch case for Gary, um, who had, uh, these are his final, actually, these are final teeth, um, uh, which he had made. So. Uh, by one of my referrals, but sometimes you got to get creative, right? So uh, in this patient's case, again, we could have done four, but I like six and using the crustal sinus kit in the posterior will allow us to place implants and get better AP spread, right? Um, because again, if one of these fails and they're all on four, you're, you're shot. And trust me, I've learned from experience. So why we're trying to do this once for the patient, the goal is to set them up the right way. And these are her final prosthetics. So this is the before, and again, this is the after. Um, and uh, again, we've got some really nice AP spread. And this is a, a hybrid actually uh, on, a, on a bar, uh, which is what we're commonly making unless the patient wants to make a full, you know, wants to pay the additional cost for the parental zirconia. Um, what about a case again, where the patient has a very high smile line, right? So again, planning is important. Bone reduction, we can't go FP1, we can't go direct to fixture here because the patient wants to have an improvement in their smile line. So bone reduction really is the only option at this point, and it would happen if the patient had crown lengthening done anyways. Not that that would have been a good option, but removing the bone to the proper height, not only where we needed to go, and most importantly to accommodate the work, um, but to give her the smile that she wants. So the bone reduction happened, the implants got placed at the proper position, and then that's her final smile now. Um, and again, when she smiles now, she doesn't see that junction, number one, number two, um, you know, she, she sees the, the, the normal amount of tooth, tooth display that we want her to show, okay? Um, lastly, uh, periimplantitis cases, I think we're all going to start seeing many of these. And what do we do? Is it a case that we abandon? Is it a case that we take out implants and let it heal? Um, my, I still say we can, with good education, understanding what happened and why, good informed consent, patient management, we can remove these implants, okay? So uh, my first step in a case like this, this patient had three implants placed uh, about nine, eight, nine year, eight, eight or nine years ago. Um, I never went for any hygiene, by the way. So obviously education and, and setting up expectations are really important. Um, the first step was exposure of the mental nerve. So there's the mental nerve right there and on this side here. Um, the second was to as safely and age traumatically as possible remove the implants. Um, was not possible for some of the implants because we could not find uh, the information on the implants. So we did wind up trephining out a few and backing out a couple. Um, and then the additional implants get placed and you try to get creative and space them around the holes and I try to put in as many as I can. So uh, of course we're being respectful with the loop of the mental frame and you can see we're fairly close here. And this is one of the reasons why when we're doing any type of lower edentulous case, it's imperative to expose a mental nerve. So we know exactly where it is um, and we can visualize it. Uh, and then we just, then I went ahead and grafted. And this is again, a running continuous suture um, that we then allowed to heal. Um, once it healed, uh, we did our stage two surgery. So this is like a split flat to try to push creatinine's tissue over to the buckle, what little there is. And then the site gets sutured and this patient ended up with a fixed bar 
um, which I was not a fan of um, because of oral hygiene, but the patient now has a water pick and he's attending hygiene visits routinely. Um, and this is an MK1, so it basically latches onto the bar and the patient has this pin where he can remove the prosthetic as well, okay? Uh, but what about that case that I showed you initially where the patient has an implant and uh, you know the bone uh, is failing? So most of the time, hopefully the implant's not in the ideal position, so we can then remove the implant. This is an easy fixture removal kit, and then go ahead and place the implant a little bit more mesial in a more optimal position, and then suture the site graft, suture the site back up. And again, an immediate implant replacement can be done, okay? Um, this was a case uh, that was referred to me to restore, and obviously this was like not restorable, for, <laughs> it was nothing there to restore, and there was a freno. So same kind of technique, except a surgical phrenectomy. Um, we removed the implants. Then, thankfully, the implant wasn't in the optimal position. It was too distal. So we find the optimal position, place a new implant, and then go ahead and graft and suture. And this is how the soft tissue looked like afterwards. So the patient then returned, and we did a phrenectomy. Okay, and that phrenectomy, I just saw the patient two weeks ago, and this is what it looks like. So hopefully we'll let that heal, and he should be good. Okay, um, the last case, which is uh, again, immediate molars or replacements, you'll see there's that upper left one here, but also multiple molars that are not in the right position, angled all over the place. So this is where guided helps, um, but I did this freehand um, and it's tough because there's holes everywhere, pulling you every which way, but we can actually add, you know, place immediates if we can get some good usable bone in ideal positions. Um, so there's the ideal positions. And then we go ahead and we graph the same way that I showed you. On the upper, what I like to do in a case like this with sinus involvement is to split the tissue. So leave the infected tissue over the site. Go ahead and then do the lateral sinus lift because we needed to do lateral here to access. There was not much bone here. And then go ahead and remove the implant. If you remove the implant right away, then the risk is there could be a perforation. So once we remove the implant, we then prepped the site because there was not enough bone for an implant just on its own. We needed to augment the bone in the sinus. So this is the video just showing, you'll see the implant and the granulation tissue is still here. And I've lifted this laterally, okay? And it's a little bit tough because sometimes you'll feel the edge of the implant, so you have to do it carefully. So we maintain the, uh, the membrane and then go ahead and um, make sure it's out of the way and the key is to lift it medially enough. And now we can go ahead and put the implant in the optimal position, which in this case actually was a bit more mesial. Okay, so you can see the original hole and now I'm more centered. And then the implant goes in right away. And then we graft both the sinus and the coronal aspect, and then we suture that back up, okay? So there is the three week post-op healing, and then there is the one and a half month post-op healing of the lowers and the upper, and there is the five month post-op. You can see nice volume of soft tissue and bone and then this is the upper left. And again, I would like to do a free gingival, um, but uh, it seems we've got about four millimeters of nice tissue there. And then there's the CBCT, okay? So immediate implants, are you convinced? Do you think that these are, you know, what about holes like these? You know, are, is it possible? Um, I would say yes, um, depends on your surgical technique, of course, and your training. Um, but I think the goal for today is just to point out a lot of cases and show you that really the sky's the limit in immediate in implant dentistry. Uh, there's so many new things that are coming out all the time, but new techniques. Um, and, uh, and I would encourage you guys all to, you know, to, to look into learning about these techniques because I think this is what patients want. If you ask them, you wanna wait nine to 12 months, do two surgeries and you know, healing and cost more and this and that, or do we wanna extract, do an immediate implant and the final restoration in about four and a half months. And it oftentimes costs less and it's one surgery. What do you think your patients are going to want? This is why we're doing 450 to 500 implants a year is because patients want this treatment and they are accepting this treatment if you're offering this treatment. But you need to know how to do it. I want to stress that. So, you know, I work with a lot of doctors who refer, um, who come and observe their patient surgeries. Uh, the study club is really uh, another avenue. Um, you know, I say, you know, initially it was like, welcome to the future. But listen, guys, you know, these immediate implants have been going on for the last time. Mean, I've been doing them for the last 12 years. Um, it's the present. It's the now. It's not what's new. It's what's current, right? And I think we need to do that. Really, you're only confined by the walls that you build yourself. And, um, and, uh, and I encourage you all to hopefully step out of that comfort zone and get to the place where you can start pushing yourself in a safe 
men are with adequate training. Again, I want to state that very clearly. These are not cases you just go and pick up. Because even for the basic program, you know, we tell doctors, go find a simple case. They can't. So you're going to come across these cases where, you know, there are these challenges and what do you do? And I think the key is to take a step back, to um, take a program, uh, learn how to get comfortable with your implant system. Um, and of course, start off with easy cases, but, but I think learning, there's a lot of learning opportunities for learning how to do these types of immediate cases. And starting off, the first immediate molars, I think, would be the best case to start off for those who want to. Um, so this is my website. Uh, again, make sure you check out the Facebook and the Instagram, and I'd like to thank you guys. Um, we do have an AGD verification code, so if you guys could make note of that, it's MAR, like March 30th, 30. The year 2020 and it's Odin which is our organization Ontario Dental Implant Network um, and I think Hasham will jump on now and uh, maybe tell us some more details about that and if we have any questions I'd be happy to answer those thank you guys for spending the time hope I didn't bore you thank you so much for that Azim that was absolutely incredible thank you Dr. Uh, Sheikh um, that was also something that uh, you know it, it's also very um, humbling uh, what, when you place and you do implants. I, I, I do quite a bit of implants myself and then all of a sudden looking at what you do, um, it definitely, you know, there's obviously levels to the game and, uh, you know, I, absolutely incredible. So well done. So we're going to start out by, um, by going ahead and asking some questions here, Azim. Uh, these are the ones that were initially presented in the chat group. So um, I have Mustafa who asked two questions. Um, his first question was he was wondering about the protocol of immediate implants or if there's any classification of the sockets. So, I mean, Tarno has a classification of sockets for immediate molars, like a type A, type B, type C. There's nothing really, so, you know, you can look that up. It's by Dennis Tarno. Um, but uh, as far as immediate implants, um, you'll see the classification for myself is whether I feel like I can stabilize the implant. Okay, and then I even showed you some cases where we didn't get stability. So, so if, you can, if you feel like you can stabilize the implant and you're comfortable in the area that you're working on, then um, I don't know of any classification. I do have a protocol that I follow. It's a 12 steps of surgery that I've, that I've lectured on. I think I, um, I'm, I've offered Hashem that lecture. as well but it goes to be we can have as a future lecture or we'll figure that out thank you uh um uh, as you the next question is from Vasant, and his he has multiple questions but the first one is do you use a bone test a uh, bone density tester at four months yeah so like an isq value i don't use isq for everything i'm kind of old school i'll put my torque wrench on it and i'll reverse torque and if it passes 25 um, but I have been more into the penguin unit or the Austell unit to check. Um, but I think it's important to do that. It just provides another record as to the, the, the restorability. But mm -hmm. four months would be a good time. And, and I think from, from an economical perspective, the penguin is uh, priced a lot more competitively than the Austell, just for exactly. those who would start looking around. Um, his next question was, um, do you add prices or costs to the procedures uh, such as grafting or PRF? Um, do, um, he's asking about the codes, but I think that that's something that we can, uh, you know, he can email us that. But he's asking if the fees increase when you are doing any type of um, grafts or PRFs with your immediate cases. Yes, absolutely. So PRF, I just incorporate into the cost of my bone grafting. So I would encourage you all just basically, if you reach out to ODA Practice Advisory, they can send you um, the guidelines for bone grafting, and it has all the codes in there. Um, it has all the codes on how to use the codes. Um, and that was all available to the ODA members, just nobody ever got it. So surprise, surprise, but you can request it. Number two, I just, I would encourage you just to set a fee for your grafting. So if you think it's simple, like, okay, it's gonna be 600 bucks. You know, if it's moderate, it's gonna be 1500. If it's super crazy, it's gonna be 2000 or 2500. And then just roll with that. Put the code in, add the expenses, and then move on. If you, you try to do too much with codes, it becomes too complicated. Yeah, I agree. Um, the, the next question is from Michael. He asks, why do you like the metal temp abutments versus the gray slash white 
quick temp plastic abutments? So the quick temp abutment is not easy to trim. It, 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 it kind of starts, it kind of starts folding over on itself. Number one, number two, it's bulkier. It's a lot bulkier mm -hmm. I find. And number three, when you go to pick up, when you, when you put your alginate over top and you go to find the hole, it's easier to see the metal than it is to see the white abutment. So for those reasons, I, and also I'm not sure if the quick temp abutments come in different gingival heights, but mm -hmm. the metal ones come in one millimeter and three millimeters. So I, I like that as well. Perfect. Um, Vasant asks in, an, in another question, he says, do you use post-op rinses during healing as some periodontists don't like brushing after surgeries? Yeah, so we're going to have to start charging Vasant now for questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Vasant, how's it going? Um, basically, what, we're do what I'm doing is no Paradex for two days post-surgery. So they're just nothing for 24 hours. Then they're rinsing with warm salt water thereafter. And then they can use the Paradex, but it needs to be at least after two to three days post-surgery. Because of the issue with chlorhexidine and fibroblast prolifer proliferation and the impediment of that. Um, and honestly, some patients, for some of these cases, they didn't use any Paradex. They just use good old fashioned warm salt water. Sometimes mm -hmm. I find that, that that's just good enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jastikar asks, um, which, by the way, I don't even know how he's even on this because he was just in London and I think he was gone, going to Windsor, but um, he, he might have listened to this on the road. But he asks, do you confirm the osteomiatal complex is patent prior to a sinus lift? Yes, absolutely. Well, what we do is we all of our cases are sent for CT. Osteomiatal complex is generally not seen in the field of view scans that we're taking because we're taking either a 5x5, five five, which is a single site, maybe a five by eight or an eight by eight. Now, if you send them to Canary, they're able to take a 12 by 12. Mm -hmm. But for most cases, we're not checking the patency. Should we for lateral sinus lifting cases? Absolutely, we should. But if there's any type of sinusitis, chronic, um, or any type of um, you know, um, pathology, then of course we need to address that before we do any type of surgery. Awesome, perfect. Um, the other thing too is that if any, if uh, I, I ask everybody to just type in your name to the chat line and also your email address, just to make sure that we're tracking everybody who did attend um, uh, this virtual lecture for CE points. Um, the other thing too, uh, if you guys, if anybody has any type of questions that they would like to ask, all that we ask you to do is just press unmute, ask the question, and then go ahead and mute your um uh mute your your uh, your mic one more time um as well as um dr azim is answering it okay so we'll leave this open i guess for anybody who wants to ask any questions thank you thank you very much for uh for this wonderful presentation dr sheikh and dr dr shergan i just wanted to ask a quick question if that's okay mm -hmm. um sure. uh, in the case that the implant was placed uh, uh superficial it wasn't deep enough uh, could you just go back and torque it and deepen it and then wait again for the healing? Or did you just have to replace the whole implant in, in and of itself? Uh, so that implant actually had been placed and restored. Is that the one that you need? Yes. Yeah. So, so if, you come into a, if you come into a situation where you find your implant is not going more apical, your no implant cuts apically. So you will have to remove the implant. Because if you start torquing it more and more, all of a sudden it's going to get really tight and then it's going to go whoosh mm -hmm. and it's going to start spinning. So you have to remove the implant and then re-prepare, check your depth. And this is one of the biggest common issues that happens with guided surgery is the guide is not seated properly. You're gun shy. You're not going all the way down. And now you go place your implant and it doesn't go to depth. So always. You there, Azim? Can you hear us okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm good. Any other questions okay. or are we good? Um, any other questions, I guess. Okay, perfect. I think we are good. Um, I just wanted to make another quick announcement. Uh, tomorrow we have the one and only Steve Chang speaking to us. Uh, he's going to be talking about zero, the zero bone loss concept. Um, that's going to be at 4 p.m. tomorrow. 
Um, the following day, we have uh, Dr. Goth Sue speaking to us also at 4 p.m. And um, on Thursday, we have Manisha Jindal, who will be talking about a topic on orthodontics. That will be at 12 p.m. And then we're wrapping up the week with um, Dr. Vic Jindal, who's going to be giving us a very interested, interesting uh, uh, overview about the current uh, situation that's happening in, uh, um, obviously, in dentistry and in the entire world and how that affects us dentists as we go back to work, hopefully in May or June at the latest. And um, it's something that's going to be very, very uh, informative, very insightful about what we're currently dealing with. Um, so please let us know if you have any questions or concerns. Um, and thank you guys so much for attending today. We had up to 160 participants, which was absolutely incredible. And uh, once again, thank you so much, uh, Azim, for, for everything. That was very, very informative. So thanks for putting that together. No, thank you, man. Thanks for having me. And I'm assuming, will they, you'll just get all the emails, you'll send them to me, and then I will email everybody uh, uh, basically the C once they provide the verification code to you. Is that what will happen? You got it. What I'll, pro probably just to make things a lot easier for you. As soon as I'll email everybody, and as soon as um, you get the email, provide me with the uh, verification code. And then I'll just go ahead and um, just provide you with the names, Azim, just to make it a lot easier for you as well, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah, that's great. Excellent. Thank you Perfect. Guys. All righty. Thank you guys so much and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Yes, guys. Have a wonderful right. day. Thank you so much, Shem. See you guys. Thank no you. problem at all. Bye.